This is Pisces, a novel in the Multiverse Collection, written by D.N. Leo, narrated by Catherine Edwards. Prologue The Beginning of Time He picked up a ball of dirt hardened by time, space, and dimensional shifting, and nursed it in his hands. This piece of land was a haven for him, a place where he could harvest the material to make his keys. People called him Key Master. He didn't just make any keys. His keys unlocked sources of energy and power that all creatures in every world would kill for. He considered himself an artist in the key-making business. He had come from nothing. He didn't know how he was created. He hadn't had a shape, let alone a name. He couldn't remember exactly when what he did had become his name, but he was more than happy to accept the name given to him by his clients. As for his form, he had gone through some trial and error before settling on his new human shape. He was a collection of energy. His creator, whom he didn't know, had made him for a purpose. When he'd grown strong and had taken control of his own actions, his creator was no longer important to him, so he had terminated him. It had probably been too soon to kill his master. He hadn't yet had a chance to discover his purpose, what he had been created for. He'd wandered around the multiverse in search of a purpose and had taken many shapes and forms in many worlds. But in the material world, the human shape had appealed to him most, so that was the shape he adopted. He was attracted to the ever-changing skin tone of the Eudasians, but he did not like their minds. Some might look at them as innocent, but to him, they were simply too naive. He had the mind of the underworld. Not only did he like it, he planned to keep his mind sharp for eternity. The ball of dirt in his palms stared up at him. He transfused some energy into it. It looked happy, he thought. He had made several keys over the years, but this one was the most special. He chuckled at that thought. He thought the same thing when he'd made his second key. Damn! He cursed when the ball melted and exploded in his palms. He blew gently at the burns on his palms, and soon the skin returned to its usual light blue tone. Right now, that was his favorite skin color. In a few hundred years, when he was bored with this color, he might consider changing to another. Too much mercury, he muttered to himself, shaking his head to clear his mind. This experimental key was a bad idea. He should return to his usual method of key-making and look for the main ingredient, precious stone. Hunger pains clawed at his stomach. Looking around him, he noticed a slight movement in a small shrub nearby. He sniffed the air and smelled the faint scent of flesh and blood. I'm stronger than you think, he growled. He hadn't killed his creator for no reason. He'd been a good student, until his creator told him he was weak and couldn't resist the temptation to kill. He made powerful keys and had saved thousands of creatures. He didn't see the harm in killing just a handful of them. The multiverse would be less crowded for it. He hadn't asked to be created. Thus, if he killed... That was the responsibility of his creator. He thirsted for blood, and he needed to kill now. He strode toward the little bush, pushing away the weeds and tall grass. In front of him, sitting on a soft nest of wild daisies and feathers, and smiling up at him, was a baby angel. Her little angel wings were as tiny as the hand fans he saw the goddesses at the Babylonian court use for no apparent purpose other than decoration. <coughs> the baby curved her lips and cooed, then made other noises that made no sense to him. She flapped her fancy little wings. You know I'm a predator, 
and I'm hungry, right? <laughs> said the baby. If you want to fly, you'll have to flap your wings harder than that. And if you want to communicate, you'll have to use a different language. I don't speak baby, if that's what that is. The angel made more cheerful cooing noises and clapped her little hands. He was about to leave, but then saw what he had been seeking for a very long time. He shook his head and couldn't believe his eyes. Just behind the baby angel, a colorful piece of rock blinked up at him. What have we here? he muttered. He reached over the baby and grabbed the rock, trying to pull it up from the ground. It was heavier than he thought. He shifted and looked at the baby angel. I'm going to have to move you aside for a bit. I need that rock, and you're right in my way. I have no idea what that means, but I'll take it as a yes. He lifted the angel gingerly out of the way and kicked up some grass and wildflowers to make a soft surface before placing her on the ground behind him. Don't worry. I'll put you back when I'm finished with this rock. Your mother will never know you've been moved. Okay? So keep quiet. Arr. He shook his head, turned around, and started digging at the base of the rock. He realized it wasn't as heavy as he thought. It was just half buried in the ground. He'd seen this material before. On Earth, they called it jade. He liked its light green color. It was extremely rare to see jade on this elusive piece of land. He pushed the tall grass and weeds aside, brushed off some dirt, and smiled at the jade rock. He continued to scoop out the dirt along the side of the rock. It was much bigger than he thought. Then he smelled it, the scent of fresh meat and blood. His stomach gave a hungry growl. He shook the thought and temptation away and kept digging. When he pushed the next little bunch of grass away, a feathered wing dropped out. Startled, he jerked back, falling on his backside. Gathering himself together, he approached the bush again. He had seen many dead creatures before. He'd killed some of them himself. After all, he was a predator. But something about this one made his stomach churn. He finished clearing the bush away and found the body of a woman. He knew an angel when he saw one and he didn't need proof to know she was the mother of the baby behind him. He had never been on good terms with angelic creatures and didn't know them well. But one thing he knew for certain, he never saw the dead body of an angel. They dissolved into light when they died. The only reason he was seeing this dead body was that her death had been undignified. She had unfinished business, her child, and she would come back. He didn't know what the angel had done or what she would have to do to get back to the predator that killed her, and there was no reason for him to get tangled up in this. Before turning back toward the baby, he inched over to the edge of the cliff and peered down. On the ground below was the body of a male angel, his body just as damaged as the female's. That must be the husband, another angry angel spirit with unfinished business. He shook his head. He bent down, jiggled the piece of rock he had been working to loosen. The blood of the mother angel had soaked into a part of the rock, turning it an edgy amber color. Her white feathers and her milky skin had turned another part of the rock a shiny white. He wanted the jade but there was no time to break the entire rock to get it. He didn't want to be here when the angry spirits of the parent angels came back or when more predators came to finish off what the others had left. He didn't need drama in his immortal life. He heaved the entire rock up onto his shoulder and walked away with it. Behind him, 
the baby angel clapped her hands and flapped little wings that would fly nowhere. Chapter 1 Earth, 2017 Lorcan reluctantly peeled the tiny recording and tracking device out from under the left sleeve of his shirt. This project and client were much too important for him to mess around. He couldn't afford to have his cover blown by an amateurish mistake at this critical stage. He looked in the mirror and adjusted his tuxedo and neatened his hair to ensure he had the million-dollar looks his cover required. One last job, and he'd have enough to retire from this line of spy work. Then he could focus on his tech job and spend more time with Orla the love of his life. Retirement wasn't his focus, but a proposal was. He wanted to buy a beautiful ring and propose to Orla. Just thinking about it made him smile. Admittedly, both his tech job and his spy job involved stealing information. But he only stole from the worst kind of criminals. As far as he was concerned, his work was justified. Last month, he had given an anonymous tip to the police based on some stolen information, and his tip had helped stop an armed robbery at a major bank. Didn't that count for something, he thought. The phone rang. Your transport has arrived, sir, the concierge said. Thank you. I'll be right down. Adopting a polished accent wasn't too much of a stretch for him. Sometimes he wondered why he'd never told his parents he appreciated his privileged background and what they had given him. But what was the point? He shrugged absently. He'd been a runaway child, the black sheep in his family. The target didn't trust him with information, so he had no idea where the party would be. As predicted, they sent him the most conspicuous limousine available in the country. He reciprocated by letting the target pick him up from the most exclusive hotel in London, one he'd booked by charging the client 30% more. Big jobs cost big money, and they knew his rates weren't cheap. The limousine dropped him off at a yacht club in Brighton. He mentally rehearsed the steps and strategies once more before stepping onto the dark blue carpet, carpet so thick his shoes sank an inch when he set foot on it. He chuckled inside as he entertained a vision of these pretentious upper-class criminals scrambling around after discovering he had robbed them of their precious artifact. What it was exactly, he had no idea, and he didn't care. His job was to steal it and bring it back to the man who had hired him. He never got too attached to the details of a job, because attachment was the first step to disaster, spy and thief practice 101. He kept his shoulders back and his head high, and he looked like any other aloof businessman going to a prestigious party. A flash of anxiety crossed Lorcan's mind when he saw the entrance to a lavish lounge room on the boat and a group of polished-to-the-bone people having pre-dinner drinks. Something felt seriously wrong. He didn't usually operate on hunches, but he could squelch his intensifying unease. He inhaled discreetly, hoping to shake off the feeling, and he walked toward the bar, sitting down nonchalantly on one of the stools. He positioned himself to keep an eye out for the target. A loud air horn went off, making the yacht rumble a little. He looked askance at the bartender. The bartender smiled politely. It's just a signal that the boat is casting off, he said. Lorcan maintained his composure, nodded, and ordered another drink. He hadn't realized the boat would be casting off at all. He thought it would remain in the harbor, making it easy for him to escape once he had what he wanted. He didn't like swimming. Swimming from just outside the harbor was bad enough but he didn't at all like the idea of having to swim from open sea to the shore, especially when it hadn't been part of his plans. He thought of Orla again and smiled to himself. She would have laughed at him right now, seeing his reaction at the boat leaving shore. 
she could swim like a fish. But swimming was definitely not his forte. Ten minutes or so went by after the boat had left the harbor, and he still hadn't found his target, the host of the party. The man had to be on board. A stunning blonde woman in a long, blood-red velvet dress walked toward him. He had no desire to engage in conversation, so he turned quickly and pretended to look for the lavatory. On his way, he glanced up at the VIP section of the balcony above and behind the bar, and he froze. There he was, the business tycoon who dabbled in electronics, his target. Now Lorcan needed to approach him and snatch the electronic swipe code so he could access the artifact in the basement of the boat. He could break the door lock in an instant, but breaking the code of the safe would take time, and he didn't have much of that to spare, so stealing the code was his first choice. He took a few steps toward the VIP lounge, and the woman in the red dress stepped out right in front of him. Damn it, he thought, and pasted a polite smile on his face. Mitch Wayland, roller coaster tycoon. What a pleasure to meet you, the woman said in a sexy, throaty voice. He chuckled. The woman had done her homework with a guest list and had seen his picture. Obviously, though, she hadn't researched well enough to know that it was only his cover. Just a line of business I am lucky to do well in. I'm not exactly a tycoon. Aren't you? She smiled, tracing a finger down his lapel. I'd like another glass of champagne, but these heels are killing me. Would you mind getting me another glass at the bar upstairs? She handed him her glass before he could come up with an excuse to get away from her. As soon as his hand touched her velvet glove, he felt a prick on his finger. He shook his head to clear his vision, and then his world started to spin. The woman smiled at him. She thrust one velvet-gloved hand at him. He could see it better now. It hadn't been her glove, but a gigantic diamond ring she wore that had pricked him with a needle. He saw the needle as if she were moving in slow motion. Or maybe he was seeing things that way because his mind had become numb after his initial jab. She struck him once more in the neck. He knew what she was doing, but he couldn't move either to grab her hand or to get away from the ring. Oh, hell, he thought, before the image of the woman in front of him became blurry and his world started to spin out of orbit. Chapter 2 Liv thought it would be a lot harder to get a man of Lorcan's caliber. His reputation in the business typically made his opponents cringe, but not her. She didn't have much experience in spying, but she was sure she was a better assassin than he was. He was lucky killing him wasn't her mission. Otherwise, the job would be a slam dunk, and she would be bored out of her brain for the rest of the evening. Lorcan's knees buckled, and he fell into her arms. Oh, darling, you've had a bit to drink, haven't you? She said as she dragged him, staggering to a nearby room, and pushed him inside. He was gorgeous, leaning against the dark, polished wood wall of the small cabin. Dark hair, masculine face, lips made for sex, and striking blue eyes that were fighting for consciousness. The dose isn't nearly enough to sedate a man your size, so don't pretend. We have work to do, and I don't want to hurt you. She brushed a stray lock of hair off his forehead and looked into his eyes. Hmm, I guess you aren't pretending. Alcohol and sedatives probably aren't a good mix for you. I'll fix you up when we get downstairs. The compartment served as an internal elevator and went down to the basement. Liv was relieved as the woeful music on deck faded out and became inaudible. She pushed open the door and saw a crew member walking past. She pulled out a gun with a silencer and fired point-blank at the man. Then in one swift move, she pulled his dead body into the small compartment 
and pushed Lorcan out. Let that be an example to you, she muttered to Lorcan as she pushed him along the very narrow corridor of the basement. He staggered left and right and tried to sit down several times. She had to haul him up and keep pushing him along, steering him in the right direction. Keep walking. You can barely stay conscious, so don't even think about running. Soon they arrived at a small storage room door, and Liv pushed him inside. She came in with him and locked the door. He glanced around at the room. If we're after the same thing, it certainly isn't in here, Lorcan said, his voice slurred by the effects of the drug. She pushed Lorcan slightly aside, pulled out a compact laser gun, and etched a large circle on the ceiling. As soon as the circle was closed, the ceiling dropped down, bringing with it the safe from the room above. From the hole in the ceiling, the tycoon looked down in astonishment. Liv smiled up at him, pointed her silenced gun upward, and fired. The tycoon, screaming profanity, ducked out of the way of the bullet. He's not a very good host, is he? She said to Lorcan, who had slid to the floor and was about to lose consciousness. She punched a button on the wall of the compartment. It shuddered. The ceiling closed up again, and the compartment detached itself from the boat. A submarine? You've got to be kidding me, Lorcan slurred. Yes, it's a disposable submarine. You have three minutes to get the box out of the safe. No time to nap now. No chance, he closed his eyes. You can remain at the bottom of the ocean with the safe or remove the box and go to the surface. She grabbed his hand, snapped a locked band to his wrist, and secured his hand to the handle of the safe. He stomped his foot against her abdomen, causing her to fall backward and hit her head on the wall. She didn't pass out, but she couldn't move. The hit had dazed her. It took Lorcan only fifteen seconds to free himself from the locked band. He looked at the lock on the safe. She knew the challenge would be tempting for him, and she was right. In a mere thirty seconds, he had the safe opened. In it, he found a small steel box, slightly larger than his palm, the lid engraved with strange symbols. Liv flexed her muscles, but still couldn't move. Her vision was blurry, but through the blur, she saw a stream of white smoke appear behind the Lorcan. She opened her mouth to warn him, but no sound came out. In the center of the small submarine compartment, a white-haired woman dressed in a long black robe appeared. Lorcan growled, You've got to be a hologram. She raised her right hand in the air, and the steel box in his hand shook and flew toward her. On the floor, Liv did her best to reach for her gun. On her first attempt, only her fingertips touched it. She tried once more and grabbed the weapon. She fired at the woman in the black robe. The bullet went through her head, as if it wasn't even there, and hit the wall of the compartment. So you're definitely a hologram, Lorcan said and dove at the hand holding the steel box. The woman glared at him with bloodshot, witchy eyes. Lorcan jerked his hand back as soon as it touched her. You're real, he gasped. The woman in black held the box tightly. Lorcan tugged at it and pushed her backward with his other hand. She gripped the box even tighter, grabbing his neck with her free hand to choke him. The woman had to be some kind of supernatural being to have the strength to choke him with one hand, holding him up with his legs dangling. Lorcan couldn't free himself. He slammed the hand holding the box again and again to the wall as hard as he could. When she finally dropped him to the floor, he kicked her legs out from under her. They both fell to the ground, but she wouldn't let go of the box. Liv scrambled up. Get away from the box, she shouted. Lorcan let go and kicked his feet against the wall to slide himself backward on the floor. 
Liv fired at the lock on the box three times. It sprung open, revealing a round artifact inside, with three interlocking colored stones. The woman in the black robe hissed and backed away from the artifact, as if afraid to touch it. Then the submarine shuddered and exploded. Chapter 3 Cool, calm, serene. Those were the best words Lorcan could come up with to describe what he was experiencing. The best thing he could do to prolong this pleasure was to keep his eyes closed and enjoy. When he finally opened his eyes, he sighed. Orla had been right. They'd known each other since they were kids, and she'd sworn she'd never seen him totally relaxed. What she didn't know was that he was only tense when it came to her safety. Lorcan promised himself he would finish this job early and then take Orla on a long vacation to a remote island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, where they would lie in the sun all day and watch fish swimming lazily in a fish tank. Why they had to be in a fish tank, he really had no idea. He blinked and bolted upright. He was lying on a lab bench in a room with a glass ceiling belonging to an immense fish tank. There was no way this was a hallucination. Fish swam above him and outside the glass walls, surrounding him on both sides. Am I dead? Is this a submarine version of heaven? But Lorcan was sure if he had died, he wouldn't go to heaven. So he ruled that idea out. Strands of seaweed floated around him, and fish swam to and fro in the water above and to the sides of him. When a curious little rainbow of striped fish swam close to his face, one of them wrinkled its nose and winked at him. Oi! Lorcan shouted and backed away from the fish. It looked at him, seemingly amused. Then it turned around, wiggled its tail, and swam away. Lorcan turned his head toward the bed. He felt dizzy. His knees buckled again, and he fell, grabbing the edge of the bed. He found himself lifted by supporting hands. Someone helped him onto the bed. He turned around and drew in a sharp breath when he saw the most beautiful face. I'm Faye, your nurse. Take it easy. I want you to lie back down. You've been in an explosion. Explosion? Oh, yes, that's right. I must have a concussion. Faye stuck a needle into his arm. He frowned. There were no beeping machines, no drip line, and none of the medical tubes and equipment usually attached to an IV needle. Yes, you had a severe concussion. His vision started to blur. I was hallucinating. I thought I saw a fish winking at me. Fay chuckled. <laughs> that wasn't a hallucination. You saw Daisy, and she's a naughty little fish. I told her not to disturb our patients, but she did wink at you. A talking fish? Where am I? He grabbed his left side and felt a lingering pain. He tried to jump off the bed he was lying on, but his knees wouldn't hold his weight, and he landed face down on a sandy floor. Faye helped him up and gave him a disapproving look. You're in no shape to move around like that. He looked around again and saw the walls weren't glass, but rock with bits of embedded shell and coral. Outside the walls, schools of fish swam by at leisure. He glanced at what looked like a door and thought if he dared to push it open, he would walk right into a giant fish tank. He remembered the explosion, the submarine, the spooky woman in the black robe, and the unaccomplished spy job. He felt the urge to search his pocket for the artifact, but figured it was most likely not there. If he had grabbed it, whoever had undressed him would have seen it and probably taken it. Did I get the artifact at all? Or was it lost at sea? He searched his mind frantically for an answer, but none came to him. Where are my companions? he asked. Let's talk later. When the doctor clears you, I'll take you around so you can see where you are. But you were brought into this hospital alone. Have you been taking care of me this whole time? 
Fay raised an eyebrow. I mean, I should say thank you. He donned a fake but friendly smile, but could feel the potent drug she'd given him starting to take effect. His eyes felt like they weighed a ton, and her voice seemed to echo in his head. How long have I been here? Only a couple of days. You have nothing to worry about. Just rest. Faye laid him down. Before falling into oblivion, he heard a male voice. It was saying something in a language he didn't understand, and Faye responded in the same strange language. The short conversation became quickly heated, and the male voice rose in volume and then spoke in English. You don't think I know your origin? You even speak the human's language. Don't fool around with me. It's English, one of the languages used on Earth. And yes, I'm educated and well-traveled. I like the English language, and I use it a lot. But that proves nothing about my origin. I use English to speak with Lorcan because it's his mother tongue. All right. So pry the information out of him, then, will you? I told you, his condition doesn't allow for long conversation. He doesn't seem to remember anything. Memory loss after trauma is very common in humans. I am amazed he survived the blast. If it's unlikely he'll give us any information, terminate him. I don't want to waste resources. That's not for you to decide. I'm in charge here. It's because of me that he's still breathing. Lorcan felt an impact against his bed, and he thought maybe the man had shoved Fay. He flexed the muscles in his arms, but he knew he had no hope of moving any time soon, so he kept his eyes closed. He's injured. He couldn't help it. He felt Fay's face pushed down against him. The male voice was close. He couldn't help it, or you couldn't help falling for his pretty face. How many times have we had a human being down here who survived? Zero? So you couldn't help it, could you? I'll try. When he wakes, I'll ask him. If he dies, all of your efforts will be in vain. I'm not a man of patience. Wake him up, and I'll beat the information out of him. Lorcan felt his upper body lifted as if someone had grabbed him by the neck. That won't help anything. If he dies, you'll lose everything, said Fay. A pause, and then his body was thrown back onto the bed. All right, I'll give you two more days. Get the info out of him, or I'll finish you both. Lorcan felt some struggling beside him on the bed. He thought Faye was likely trying to push the man away from her. He tried to move again without success. Then he heard the unmistakable sound of a slap. The man chuckled. One day you'll crawl to me and beg me to take you, Faye. Silence. Then Lorcan's consciousness slipped away from him. Chapter 4 The key master put the baby angel back on the nest of grass, which he knew now had been created by the female angel to give her child some comfort. He didn't know if the mother had done it before or after she was attacked. But did it matter? He fluffed up the grass around the baby. All right. It was nice meeting you. I don't get along well with angelic creatures, so let's just pretend we never met. No hard feelings. He stood to leave, but then heard a croaking sound. No, you're not going to cry. That's not going to work. He crouched down. Listen, I don't do babies. I eat them for breakfast. You should be scared of me. Dad. All right, you've got me. I don't eat babies. But I am a predator. I've killed other creatures simply for sport. I don't eat them because they taste disgusting. 
but I do enjoy the smell of flesh and fresh blood. The baby stared at him and stopped making noises. See, you angels can't handle what I do. You don't understand, and you don't appreciate it. I'm going to call this experience a wash. He stood. The baby still didn't make a sound. Now what? You're not even going to say goodbye? Silence. He shrugged, picked up his precious piece of jade, and walked away. Then he heard a low growl. He turned around and saw the baby angel still sitting in the grass, the same look as it had had on its face before. The baby wasn't scared, but it had sensed the creature nearby, which had now emerged from the bush as a gigantic wolf on eight hairy spider legs. You are sinfully ugly, he said to the creature. You've offended my eyes and the baby angels. Do you see the look of disdain on this baby's face? The creature ignored him and crept toward the baby. He recalled the wounds on the mother angel's back. They were definitely caused by the claws on those spider legs. He realized now that the mother had hidden her baby from this creature, and he had pulled the baby out in plain sight for the predator to find. He glanced around. There didn't seem to be any more spider things coming. He could handle one. Given it was his fault the baby had been found, he might as well fix his grave mistake. Struggling, he put the jade down and darted at the creature, pulling his rock-carving knives out as he did so. In the midst of battle, he couldn't tell which part was which on the creature's body. Once he had slain it, he wiped the blood and viscous substances from his hands and the knives on his pants. He smiled at the baby. Sorry you had to see that. There was no response. All right, I know you're a little scared. I'll take you away from this blood and gore. But be clear about this. It's just temporary. As he reached to pick up the baby, the ground began to rumble. The rocks beneath his feet shifted slightly. He peered over the edge of the cliff where he had seen the male angel's body and saw an army of the wolf spider creatures coming. He was a predator, but he was no fighter. He had no time to stop and think. He grabbed the baby and charged toward higher ground. The tapping noises of thousands of spider legs climbing up the cliff echoed around him. From above, they looked like ants, but he was sure these creatures could do a lot more damage than ants ever could. He saw the hillside and thought of the Damon Gate, the neutral ground of all things. He would take the baby there for protection. He wouldn't need the protection himself. Not that he disliked the Damon Gate, but he didn't think they would accept him because he didn't believe in their true, fair, and neutral moral principles. They had maintained that reputation for thousands of years, and he was going to have to trust them for the sake of the baby. The Damon Gate wasn't far. He didn't have to turn around to know that the first pack of spider wolves have climbed to the top of the cliff. But he turned around anyway, facing them as he held the baby in his arms, and he saw that it was too late to run. Chapter 5 Lorcan felt a tug at his side. He opened his eyes slightly and gradually regained his bearings. Faye's face was very close to his as she wrapped her arms around his shoulders to lift him up. He opened his eyes wider. She startled, seeing he was awake, and her face was much too close to his. If he turned his head sideways, her lips might have touched his own. Lorcan still couldn't move. What are you doing? he asked. Put some clothes on. I need to take you out of here. And you'll freeze to death in this hospital gown. He glanced down at his body and said, I don't see any gown. She dropped him back onto the bed. I needed to take the gown off to put your shirt back on. I'm a nurse. You think I've never seen a naked man before? Okay. I'm sorry. I can't move yet. 
So can you please help me get my shirt back on? She glared at him for a few seconds before lifting his shoulders to pull on his shirt. I know you can't move yet, and that your injury isn't what caused the immobility. It's the drug they gave you to help you recover. Like a prison without the bars and shackles. Is there a way to neutralize the effect? An antidote? Faye smiled. It was the first time he'd gotten a close look at her beautiful face in full view. Porcelain skin, long and wavy sandy hair, large blue eyes. She wore a tight top of thin material, and layers of a soft web-like material spanned the space between her arms and her body. The material clung tightly to her perfectly toned upper body, flattering every feminine curve. She looked just like a mermaid. That's no typical nurse's uniform, Lorcan thought clearing his throat to be sure he wasn't unknowingly drooling. There's an antidote, and I'm going to give it to you now that you're awake. But you have to push it throughout your body. It will free your muscle movement. Push? You mean with my thoughts? She chuckled. Yes, believe it or not, that's how it works. Use your mind to circulate it throughout your body. I was just kidding. If I could will my way out of here, I'd do that instead. It's how our medicine works. Your human makeup is very different from ours. If you circulate the drug, your body will take what is acceptable and useful. I take it you're not human. May I ask where I am? It's okay if you're not allowed to tell me. Faye smiled, but he hated to see the sadness hidden in her smile. I can tell you after we get out of here. Will you take the drugs? I'm not supposed to give them to you, but I disagree with them holding you captive. He closed his eyes. Okay. Jab me. He felt a prick at the jugular on his neck, and then the sensation of a cool liquid flowing through his veins. The door of the room slid open suddenly. Faye startled and stepped away from the bed. Doctor... He was cold, so I took the liberty of giving him back his clothes. A seven-foot-tall man with sandy hair, a fair complexion, and blue eyes walked in. He wore a long white coat that reminded Lorcan of a lab coat. Yes, I was cold, so I asked for her help, Lorcan said. The man looked at Faye, then back at Lorcan. She's supposed to follow my orders and my orders only, he approached Faye. She backed away, her back pressing against the glass wall. The lazy fish floating behind the glass scooted away in a hurry. The doctor flexed his wrist and punched a red button on a shell-shaped control panel. No, please don't, Faye whimpered. Outside the glass, Lorcan saw the immense shadow of a creature closing in from a distance. It looked like a great white shark swimming toward them. He did his best to circulate the drug throughout his body. The doctor slammed Faye's body against the wall and then reached his hand up toward the ceiling. Faye didn't cry, but bit her lip and stared straight into the doctor's eyes as he lifted her from the ground. One day you will pay for what you're doing. Well, I'm afraid you won't live to see that day. Lorcan scrambled off the bed and landed on the floor. The drug hadn't made its way to his legs yet. When the doctor turned around and saw him on the floor, he dropped Fay and, crouching, turned toward Lorcan. What have we here? Are you so strong that you can snap out of the drug yourself? Or did she give you the antidote? Either way, I've been thinking my tiger might be hungry. I think he'd be satisfied with you as his lunch. A tray of medical equipment rained down on him as Faye grabbed the tray and swung it as hard as she could at the doctor's head. The strike didn't cause him significant harm. He winced, more from discomfort than from pain, and turned his head toward Faye. Lorcan grabbed a scalpel from the ground 
Using one hand to prop up his body, he grabbed the doctor from behind with his other hand, pulling him to the floor. In one swift move, he slit the doctor's throat with a scalpel. Blood spurted from the wound. The doctor toppled over, staring up at the ceiling with dead eyes. Blood had spattered on Faye's clothes, and her body shook with fear. Biting her lips and ignoring the tears streaming down her face, she darted toward Lorcan. We have to get out of here. You go. My legs aren't working yet, and I'm too heavy for you to carry. Outside the glass window, drawn by the stench of blood, the shark smashed its jaws against the glass over and over, baring its sharp teeth. Unable to bite its way in, it turned around and started slamming the side of its muscular body against the glass. Lorcan felt the whole room shudder with the impact of the attack. He heard a haunting sound, and then from the dark water in the distance, a school of sharks swam toward them. Chapter 6 The Keymaster clutched the baby angel tightly in his arms and charged up the hill. Behind him, packs of wolves on spider legs had swarmed to the top of the cliff. They didn't look like ants now, but more like hungry, menacing predators. He put the baby down to the ground quickly and gathered some small rocks, arranging them around her. I'm afraid I can't take you to the Damon Gate. I might not be able to take care of you at all. He picked up a black rock and jabbed his knife into it. This is a common safety lock, he said to the baby, not expecting her to understand. If I can't get back to you, someone with good intentions toward you will be able to unlock it. He didn't look to see if the baby responded. He concentrated solely on the key. He had made these hundreds of times. He had a safety key with him now as well, and he could go. But he would not leave the baby unprotected. The rock had formed a round talisman shape, and he injected his energy into it. It glowed in response. The spider wolves were racing toward him. He needed more time. He blew gently on the key in his palms. It glowed once more. Patience, he reminded himself. He couldn't afford to make a mistake now. He glanced up quickly at the coming wolves and then looked back down at the key. It glowed again and then its halo simmered down. Done. He held the key in his palm and slammed it down to the ground in front of the baby. A white light appeared on the earth, encircling the baby. He smiled. The baby angel would be safe. Now he could leave. He reached into his pocket for his own key, but felt the hard push of spider legs at his back. The sharp spines on its legs dug into his flesh and tore his gown. He knew they could easily gut him from behind. His key dropped to the ground, and the spider wolf kicked it away from him with one of its legs. Warm blood spurted from his wounds. For the first time in the several hundred years of his life, he feared that choosing this human form had been a mistake. He felt his end was near. Through blurry vision, he saw the spider wolves pushing against the safety lock he'd put around the baby. They couldn't get into it, and he smiled in victory. He was the key master. He was the best, and no creature could take that away from him. As he enjoyed his last victory, another spider leg stabbed at him. He fell to the ground and lay ill. He looked at the baby angel in the circle of light. She was happy, smiling, and making cooing noises. Did she know her parents had just died? Probably not. His vision started to dim. He knew he was dying. He didn't know why he cared. But he hoped someone would take care of the baby angel. He hoped someone would care enough to unlock the safety key. Then something exploded. A thunderous sound exploding simultaneously with the body of one of the wolf spiders. He squinted. The baby angel looked at him, smiling and clapping her hands in glee. Another thunderous noise, along with another wolf spider. He had never liked the annoying sounds babies made, but he loved them now. 
the baby angel cooed, giggled, and clapped her hands again and again. And one by one, the wolves exploded into nothingness. The rest of the pack realized what was happening. They turned and fled. The baby continued to clap, and the retreating wolves exploded as they ran. The baby angel no longer needed him, and he couldn't see anyway. He closed his eyes. He could leave now. Forever. Chapter 7 Lorcan pushed the dead doctor under the lab bench and turned toward the shaking Faye. Are you okay? he asked. Faye shook her head. We killed. No one has the right to kill. It's not we. It's me. Killing isn't okay. But if I hadn't done it, he would have fed us to the sharks. We have to get out of here in one piece. Faye nodded and wiped her tears away. The room shook whenever a shark hit the glass wall. Lorcan wasn't sure how many more body slams the room could take before the glass cracked and the walls gave in. He had no intention of being the shark's lunch. His weakened legs were wobbly, and he wasn't confident he'd win a swimming competition with the sharks. But if he could hold them back, Faye might be able to get away. He stood and limped toward the glass wall. What are you doing? The door is that way. Faye pointed toward a door in the opposite direction. One of us has to stay, Faye. The sharks are here because of me. You need to get away while I hold them back. It's the least I can do for you. And you plan to hold them back with your bare hands? Lorcan slipped his hands into his pockets, finding the artifact, but none of his weapons. He sighed. I've got no choice. You do. Run with me, she pointed toward the door. Hurry. I bet you could swim like a fish, but I can't. She rushed over to him and pulled at his elbow. Let's go. The sharks are stupid. It'll be a while before they figure out we've gotten away. Lorcan was reluctant. Just one flick of their tails and they'll get from the window to the door of the room. If we open that door now, without me standing here as bait, we'll both be shark meat. That's what you're worried about, you silly? The door and the window lead to two different and unconnected sections. The sharks can cross, but it will take time. But they'll certainly have a quick lunch if you keep standing here and they break the window. Lorcan scrambled toward the door with Faye, his legs moving a bit faster now. He was almost a hundred percent recovered. Well, why didn't you say so before? Well, I didn't know how limited your knowledge was about our world. Faye pushed the door open. Not only were they in a giant fish tank, they were in the bottom of it. Astonishingly, the water stopped at the door's opening, as if banking against a solid wall. Faye's body penetrated the invisible wall and entered the water as if there were no barrier. She walked right into the water. He pulled her back into the room, and once back inside, her body felt completely dry. She saw the expression on his face. All right, I guess I should explain. The water beyond the glass and the air in this room are two separate dimensions. The elements of water and air in two different dimensions don't mix. But the citizens of our world can cross between the two. We live in the air and travel via the water. Does that make sense? No, I mean not yet. But for now, do you think I can cross into the water dimension? I'm sorry, but you can't. She whistled and two sleek, dark shapes swam toward them, seemingly from nowhere. Lorcan yelped in fright before realizing they were dolphins, not sharks. Both were equipped with saddles, and they had pouches hanging down along their sides, not so obtrusive that they would impede the animals from swimming. Behind them was a glass cabin, looking strangely like a carriage. The dolphins swung around quickly, dropping the round glass carriage into the air dimension. 
The door of the carriage slid open. Faye pushed Lorcan inside. As soon as he had settled and the door had closed and sealed, the dolphins pulled the carriage out into the water. Faye dashed outside and closed the door to the room. Through the crack in the closing door, Lorcan could see the sharks had broken the glass window and entered the room. As Faye had said, the room was a different dimension. Thus the water didn't flow in from the broken window. The sharks flopped into the room and wriggled on the floor. In an instant they stood up as creatures with human-like limbs, smooth shark skin, and lizard-like faces. Lorcan couldn't help but gasp. Walking sharks! Fay entered the carriage after giving the dolphins instructions. She smiled at Lorcan. We call them shark elves. They're bad news. She pointed to the dolphins to their left. One had a sparkling seashell on the middle of its head, just above and between its eyes. That's Miracle. Miracle turned around and winked at Lorcan. The other had a pink seashell dangling from its tail, which it wiggled when Faye pointed at it. That's Flipper. Lorcan glanced back toward the hospital room to be sure the sharks weren't breaking out. And where are we going? he asked Faye. Nepalimbus. And before you ask, it's a dimension, not an undersea city on Earth. Well, it's certainly not Atlantis, Lorcan said. What? Never mind. They heard a bang, and a loud noise reverberated through the water, pushing the carriage slightly askew. Faye glanced outside. They're faster than I thought. She opened a window of the carriage, this one with a real glass barrier to stop the water from getting inside. Miracle and Flipper, let's go now. The dolphins wagged their tails, emitted some cheerful whistles, and then dove deeper into the endless sea of water. Lorcan closed his eyes and promised himself if he could get back to the surface alive, he would never again accept a job with water involved. Do you see that? Fay asked. See what? Fay pointed upward. It felt like they were in the bottom of a deep well, looking up into a wedge of light shining down from above. It was the light of hope, but that wasn't what Fay was talking about. Lorcan was sure of that. The carriage! Lorcan squinted. Beneath the light's surface, he saw a round object hovering in the deep water. He knew it was the submarine he'd been in when it exploded. He wasn't sure whether he should tell Fay, but cleared his throat and asked, <clears throat> Is the light the water's surface? Yes, that's the shallowest spot in the area. Sometimes I can see human boats. But don't think about swimming up there yourself. Vision is only one aspect of reality. The surface in the human world is another dimension. You can see it, but crossing it is a totally different matter. Lorcan shrugged. All right, then. I won't swim up there. Not without your help. The floating object there. I think it's the same as the carriage we're using now. She shook her head. Not possible. The transport dolphins only release their carriages if they're dead. I haven't seen a report of an accident. He felt guilty for lying to her, but he pressed on. So nurses at the hospital process traffic information as well? She smiled. The sadness in her smile intensified his pangs of guilt. He looked again and asked no more questions. Chapter 8 Lorcan bolted up, hitting his head on the ceiling of the carriage. He didn't realize he had fallen asleep. Faye smiled. The drugs are still having an effect on you. You passed out for a bit. He grunted a response, but didn't think it was possible he'd passed out at the crucial point when he'd seen the shallow surface, a way to escape the deep water. But he said nothing. He glanced out the window. The architecture of the buildings was beyond anything he'd ever imagined. Every building had holes where doors and windows should be, and the merfolk swam in and out of them. The structures themselves seemed delicate and in danger of collapsing. The water made the rock more buoyant, 
and that had to be what was keeping the buildings up. Is this Nepalimbus? No, you're on the outskirts. You can see it's still underwater. In the city, there's both land and air, like what you have on Earth. Have you been anywhere above the water? Fay turned and looked him in the eye. I don't want to lie to you, so don't ask. Shortly, they entered an area where the water was clearer. Lorcan could see the city from the outside, and it seemed the water simply stopped at the magnificent stone arch, as if banking up against a glass wall. It looked like the water he'd seen from the inside of the hospital room. The city was magnificent, light, bright, and bursting with activity. It seemed like he was entering a modern version of Rome, Greece, or even New York. Lorcan shook his head and chuckled to himself. He should have been able to come up with more places to compare it to, but these were the places he'd visited. Perhaps he should travel more when he went back to Earth. The dolphins, as they had done before, swung the carriage around so that it parked inside the air area. Lorcan opened the door and jumped out. He couldn't help but gawk at the magnificence around him. Nobody seemed to pay attention to the new arrivals. A few more carriages arrived, and the passengers disembarked just as they had. Lorcan sighed. This was apparently an everyday activity. The people were beautiful. They seemed human in shape and size, with a few slight differences, such as their angelic figures, porcelain skin, and striking blue eyes. A few more had just arrived on foot. Well, kind of. They actually swam up from the water and then simply walked into the air dimension without benefit of a carriage. Reading his mind, Faye smiled. It's much more efficient to travel between sections yourself than by carriage, if you're not caring too much. Plus Miracle and Flipper need to get paid, right? They're like cab drivers on Earth. Faye laughed and nodded. He got the impression she hadn't laughed for a long time, and he was pleased. What if the sharks find us? She shook her head. No need to worry. They don't come near in Nepalimbus. If they didn't get us out there, their master will kill them. But we killed the doctor. Isn't he their master? No, the doctor and the shark elves were somebody's pets. P pets You mean like domestic animals that people cuddle with on their laps? Faye looked at him, her eyes as cold as steel. A pet is a trained creature that a master can use for whatever he wants. I know humans separate human beings and animals into different classes, but in our world, we're all creatures. So what differentiates the species? Power, she said bluntly, and turned and walked away. Look out! He pushed Fay to the ground. His spy instincts had kicked in. A shadow rolled around a large arena that looked surprisingly like the Roman Colosseum. A steel arrow hit the statue behind them, collapsing it. Lorcan stood up and reached his hand behind him to pull out an arrow. Don't! Fay pulled him back so hard, he almost fell over. The arrow exploded, shattering the statue into thousands of pieces. There was no pressure created by the explosion, but he inhaled some of the dust before Fay could pull him away far enough that she could speak with a hand covering her mouth. Don't breathe the dust in, she told him. But it was too late. He felt dizzy, and he could feel his throat closing up. He couldn't breathe. Other bystanders were now paying attention because of the commotion the attack had caused. They rushed over as Lorcan collapsed to the ground, gasping for air. He heard the buzz of strange voices he couldn't understand. The people spoke a language he didn't understand. He heard Faye's voice speaking the strange language. Then he was lifted. There were sounds of a struggle. His body was shoved and then pulled. He heard Faye shouting. She must be angry, he thought. Someone sat him up, and his head lolled in the familiar crook of Faye's neck. She turned and whispered into his ear, I know your name is Lorcan Brody, and you're a citizen of Earth. 
You were on a job for a client when an accident happened. You aren't here by chance. The sea creatures are now out to get you. You have no choice but to trust me, Lorcan. Give me a sign that you understand what I'm saying. He wanted to respond, but his body wouldn't obey. Fay shouted to the crowd, saying something in Nepalimbian. Then she said to Lorcan, I can't wait for your consent. I have to do this, or you'll die. How? He could hear himself screaming the question in his head. He felt the prick of a needle in his neck. Cool liquid streamed into his vein, instantly opening his throat and freeing his muscles. He moved his head away from Faye's neck, opened his eyes, and saw Faye secretly spit the needle from between her lips down to the ground. He sat up and then stood up. The crowd of about twenty people backed away, observing him with caution. Faye said something to them. What did you just say? I said you're the keeper of the key of Pisces. That's how you survive the poison. What the heck does that mean? What key? She looked him in the eye, but before she could say anything more, someone in the crowd shouted. The rest of the mob turned to look at Fay. What is it? What do they want now? Lorcan asked. Fay's face had turned pale. This is bad, he thought. The group of people approached them slowly. Run, Lorcan. Run? Where? I'm not going to leave you here. You have to tell me what's going on. He pulled her behind him, although he wasn't quite sure how he would be able to protect her. A man charged at them. He didn't exactly look like the type for combat, so with a couple of mixed martial arts movements, Lorcan was able to take him down easily. The rest of the men rumbled, prepared to move toward him. A man charged past Lorcan and then stood in front of him. He was tall and formidable, with long black hair. He wore warrior armor and held a spear in his hand. The formality of the man stopped the attacking crowd in their footsteps. He turned and cast a gold glance at Lorcan. No, he glanced at Fay, who was standing behind him. Look out! Lorcan shouted as he saw a man in the crowd throw a knife. Without even looking, the warrior raised a shield in one hand to block the knife. The knife hit the shield and dropped to the ground. The crowd roared, about to attack. Run this way, Faye shouted, tugging Lorcan's hand and withdrawing in another direction. He yanked his hand away. We can't leave him behind, Faye, he said. He can handle them. I said no. He returned to the warrior, pulled out one of the daggers he kept tucked in the small of his back. The crowd charged at them with whatever weapons they had, knives, swords, spears, and daggers. There were more than twenty of them. One of them pulled out something that looked like a gun. A tall man threw a spear in their direction. Lorcan turned and saw that Faye had returned and stood by his side and that the spear was heading her way. The warrior darted over and sued his shield to block the spear, leaving his back unguarded. The man with a gun aimed at the warrior's back and pulled the trigger. Lorcan threw a dagger at the gunman. He jerked his hand back, and the bullet hit the warrior's shoulder. The warrior turned and looked at the crowd. He roared and then charged at them. Soon the crowd was nothing but body parts. He returned to Lorcan and Fay, his body covered in blood. He pointed to a small alley and said something in Nepalimbian. Then he slid his arm around Fay's back and scooted her in that direction. Lorcan followed. Not too long after that, they had settled in a cart, a square, rusted container with an engine of some sort sticking out the back and skis instead of wheels. The warrior started the engine and the machine shuddered to life. It skied up about ten feet in the air and then zoomed around the strange ancient town. Chapter 9 Don't ever do that again, Kai! Faye shouted as she tucked a blanket around Lorcan. Don't do what? Hit him in the head? Or stick my neck out to rescue you? Again? Both. 
I am not your responsibility, and he is not our enemy. Kai looked her in the eye. He was so tall, he almost had to bend over when he talked to her. He had tied back his long raven hair, revealing large shoulders that bore many battle scars. But behind his warrior facade, she knew there was a gentle soul. Fay, I'm your guard. Protecting you will always be my responsibility. But whether Lorcan is an adversary here is up to him, not us. You can't make decisions about things you don't know, she said. Then tell him. She shook her head. You can't, or you won't. Fay, he blew your cover and almost cost you your life. Everyone dies sometime. You're not just anyone. You're our only hope. And if you lose your faith, our generation will go awry. I'm tired, Kai. It's been so many years. He touched her face gently. Please, don't say that. I'll do whatever it takes to bring you back to where you belong. I don't belong anywhere or with anyone. I don't even have a real home. He pulled her into his arms and held her tightly. She could feel his body vibrating with emotions, emotions she didn't think a warrior like him would possess. Then he released her suddenly and stepped back. I apologize. I shouldn't have done that. She sighed. So now I don't even have a friend? He shook his head. We're not friends. We're not equals. And you are not a commoner. You never will be. I need you to remember that. It was reckless for you to use the antidote in the middle of the city to save Lorcan. I know he holds the key to many important things, but you weren't saving him for the greater good. What do you think I saved him for, then? Why do you think I slaved in the hospital, even when there was barely a chance he would recover from the explosion? You know what I mean, Faye. I don't read minds. I can't manipulate them the way you do. But I do understand feelings. She jabbed a finger into his chest. Is that so? Prove to me you understand what it feels like to have my family locked up in the heating ducts. She strode out of the room. He followed her, saying, I'm working on it. We'll get them out. Yeah, when? After they've rotted? After they've become nothing but burned flesh and bones at the bottom of the dungeon of this ruined society? You know what? Now that my cover has been blown, the sharks will arrive soon. I'm going to organize a rescue. We can get out now or never. Faye, it's too rushed. You don't have to do this, Kai. It's not your war. You've said it before. You're my guard, and we're not equal. That means you don't have to give your life for my family. She pushed open the door in the back alley. Their transport awaited. The rusty box shuddered to life as she approached. Ordinary mer citizens would have to use a key to turn the ignition, but she was no ordinary mer creature. The energy projecting from her could start any machine of this primitive scale without her even touching it. Fay, please think about this. We need a plan. I have it figured out. You don't. Your judgment is clouded. She wagged her finger at him. One more mention of my feelings for Lorcan, and I will never speak to you again. He backed away. Just promise me. You'll be careful. Seeing the pain in his eyes, she calmed down a bit. I have a responsibility to my people, so yes, I will be careful. Will you? He nodded and let go of the handle of the vehicle's door. From the rear-view mirror, she saw him standing there looking out for her. He had always been there for her and her family, through all the ups and downs. He had been a constant in her life. 
She couldn't imagine what it would be like if he hadn't pulled her out of the burning ruins and fled with her to this town. She promised herself to keep that in mind and knew she would be forever in his debt. Chapter 10 It had been quiet for a while. Lorcan was pretty sure Fay and the warrior had left the premises, so he opened his eyes and surveyed the room they'd put him in. High ceilings supported by large stone columns, round shape, no windows. He figured the door was most likely locked from the outside. He sat up. The quick hard hit to the head from Kai had knocked him out because he hadn't expected it. But he'd recovered shortly. He had kept his eyes closed and pretended to be unconscious to gather information. It had surprised him that Fay and Kai had conversed in English. He realized now that although Kai had a slight accent, Fay spoke perfect English. This wasn't Earth. So who were they? And why did Fay refer to him as the keeper of the Key of Pisces? He didn't know much about this place and had no intention of spying on them. He knew for sure that he wasn't on Earth and he figured he was holding some information he wasn't aware of. It seemed they all wanted him for that information. He needed to get out of here. He approached the door, and as he had thought, it was locked. He chuckled. It would be insulting if it took him more than five seconds to unlock it. He shouldn't be too haughty, though, because he could tell this was only a residential house. The lock wasn't designed to keep anyone inside. He glanced around the room. Light pierced the small holes scattered about the wall. He approached them and peeked through one of the holes. He could see the landscape of the city, the same as before, vibrant and strange. He smiled to himself. It was land and air, meaning he could escape. He picked the lock in four seconds and stepped out into a grand hallway flanked by white columns made of what looked like polished coral. A similar pattern was repeated in the large floor tiles. A million stars sparkled on the walls, creating a scene of the cosmos. Lorcan shook his head in disbelief. The cosmos under sea? The resplendence confirmed what Kai had said. Fay wasn't a commoner. Regardless of what world this was, this wasn't an ordinary residence. When he approached the end of the hallway, he saw the thin silvery fabric from the hem of Fay's dress, the one she'd worn at the hospital, in the gap under the door to a side room. The fabric moved in and out and sideways, as if someone wearing the dress was moving around behind the door, not realizing part of it was visible from the hallway. He glanced at the empty end of the corridor and inched forward, making a move to escape. Then he stopped at the door. He wasn't going to sneak out. Fay had helped him and rescued him. She had put herself in danger by doing so. If he had doubts, he would ask Fay about them to her face. He inhaled, left the door, and turned back to the side room. Before he knocked... The door swung open. The couple who walked out hadn't anticipated running into Lorcan. By all appearances, and by the looks on their faces, they hadn't expected to see anyone at all. The man's shirt was undone, and his trousers hadn't yet been zipped up. The woman was wearing Fay's dress. Her hair was tousled, and her face still blushed. Her lips were slightly swollen obviously from recent sexual activity. The woman yelped. The man hissed audibly and pulled out a short handgun that Lorcan had only seen in steampunk movies. He raised the gun at Lorcan and said something in Nepalimbian. Chapter 11 Faye sauntered into a stupendous square room, tracing her fingertips along the silhouettes of the marble statues. It would have cost the owner a fortune to obtain such an art collection on earth, she thought. She loved art, but had never had the heart to spend her funds on things other than her life mission, which was not pretty in any way. Pexami, 
the most notorious gang leader in the outskirts of the submarine dimension, entered the room abruptly and walked straight toward her. We agreed never to meet in public. She smiled and gestured widely at the room. I consider this location private, don't you? He shrugged. Is this how you usually treat guests? She asked. He sighed to refrain from showing his frustration and punched a button on the wall. Pure water for our guest, he ordered. Shortly afterward, the door slid open, and a man with a seahorse body walked in on two legs. He set the water down, then respectfully bowed and withdrew. You have a very interesting staff, said Fay. They're pets, not staff. You mean slaves? Pexami chuckled. <laughs> Mere technology. They do their job. That's all I care about. Fay took a sip of the pure water. She glanced at Pexami, knowing he was waiting for a compliment. The best, the most expensive water available, he said. She smiled. Pleased with himself, he drank his water. She praised some of the artwork to ease his mood. It worked. Then he said, What do you need? I ask for an extension on the job. Then you'll have it. A forever extension. Pexami waved his arms. I can't give you your deposit back. She smiled. I'm not asking for the money back, but I'm afraid I have to cancel the job. Come on. I know the key means a lot to you and I'm the best you can get here. Exactly. Here in this submarine dimension. But when the key floated to the human world, you were no longer the best person. As the results have shown, Sonia is, or was, my best soldier. Her loss caused much damage to my business. You wouldn't have a penny of my money had I known you would use her. She isn't a soldier. She's a witch, and I told you the artifact attracts interest from the toughest players in the submarine dimension, didn't I? Spells and magic won't cut it. If she's your best bet, then seriously, you have no hope of getting the key. So I'm canceling the job. But Sonia didn't die in vain. There was an incident, or explosion of some sort, and I know for a fact that the key had been sent back into our dimension, on my turf. All you need is a bit of patience. If the key is here, I'll find it for you. Patience is something I don't have. Instead of canceling the job, I'm swapping it for a new one. What do you say? Pexami contemplated. It depends. What do you need done? I need you to get someone out of the heating ducts. Pexami stared at her blankly for a brief second. His reaction didn't surprise her. The heating ducts was the formal moniker of the nastiest prison system in the submarine dimension. That's a totally different kind of job. You can't handle it? I didn't say that. It's just very different. You're not getting another penny out of me. There are two things that make the job difficult. The heating ducts doesn't house ordinary petty thieves. Whoever it is you want me to yank out of there has to be a big deal. Second, to break into the heating ducts, I have to get the right pets. And they don't come cheap. No, pets are getting into the heating ducts. Exactly. You need high-end pets and a master of my caliber. That's what you're really paying for. As I said, I won't pay you any more money than what we've already agreed upon. If you can't do the job, I have someone else in mind. Good luck. Faye smiled and turned as if to leave. Can I think about it? He asked to her back. Without turning around, she said, No. As I said, I have no patience. If you accept the job now and get it done by tomorrow, you will get the money, and I'll even throw in a 10% bonus. 
If not, I'll get someone else. Others may not be of your caliber, but they'll get the job done. When and where I need it done, no questions asked. All right, I accept. Ten percent extra for the rush job. She stopped, turned around and smiled at him. Faye exited Pexami's house as quickly as she could. When she was safe and sound in a carriage used by her trusted dolphins, she opened her purse and checked the tubes of potion she had inside. A row of ten pockets, with two empty now. She knew she had to put them to good use. One for Lorcan, one in Pexami's water. A few days were enough for Pexami to finish his task for her. Then he would vanish for good. Nobody cared about the disappearance of a criminal of this submarine dimension. Chapter 12 I didn't see you, and you didn't see me, all right? Let's both of us go about our own business. Lorcan raised his hands, making peace with a couple he had caught in the middle of intimate activity. He didn't need to be super intelligent to tell they shouldn't have been doing whatever they were doing, where they were doing it. The man didn't look convinced. He approached Lorcan slowly and glanced cautiously at the empty corridor. Lorcan was a fraction taller than six foot one, but his head ended just above the man's chest. He figured he would be at quite a disadvantage in a one on one fight. Plus, the man had a gun. He backed away and the man advanced. No, Grant, not here, the woman said in English as she tugged the man's elbow. But he saw us, Millie. Is he the human you talked about? Grant's English had a heavy accent. It's a pleasure to be the topic of conversation in the middle of your busy activities, but since you know so much about me, and I don't know a thing about you, don't you think it's safe for you to let me go? Lorcan backed out further until his back hit a wall. Grant thrust the gun's muzzle in his direction. Don't, Grant. Everyone will be back soon. If you shoot him now, there won't be enough time to clean up. I'll be quick, Grant growled, once again aiming the gun at Lorcan. Lorcan raised his hand, seeking a truce. Okay, we all want the same thing. I want to leave. And you don't want Faye to know what you're doing here. So why don't you just let me leave, and we'll consider we never met. Grant brandished the gun. Dead people don't talk. And they don't give information either. I haven't given Faye the information she wants from me. I can give it to you, if you'd rather. Millie and Grant glanced quickly at each other. How can we be sure you won't cheat? Millie asked. You can't be. You'll have to take my word for it. Grant looked at Millie. I can hold him until we get to the master. If he's bluffing, they'll be up to the master to take care of him. Millie hesitated. Grant held her shoulders. Come on, honey. This could be our one and only chance. What if he's already told Faye? What if she's onto it? Did you see Kai come in? He rarely makes an appearance like that around here unless he's sure they have something. I haven't told Faye anything, Lorcan said. Why did she leave you alone? She didn't exactly. Kai knocked me out. She locked me inside the room, and I picked the lock to get out. Grant nodded. That's why she left. She didn't think you could get out. He turned toward Millie. I'll take him now, Millie. You pack your things. I'll come back for you tonight, and we'll leave together. Millie nodded. Be careful. Grant kissed Millie on the cheek and pushed Lorcan out the door. They walked onto the street, Grant right behind Lorcan. His gun was hidden inside his jacket, and he kept it pressed against Lorcan's back. It was just a normal town outside and people were going about their business. If Lorcan hadn't known this was Nepolimbus, he would have thought he was in Brighton, a seaside town in England, 
During a festive season, where people wore strange costumes and sunbathed on rocky beaches, they soon approached the dome wall and the gate that marked the boundary between the water and air dimensions. Others zoomed in and out of the gate. When they entered the water, they began swimming like fish. As soon as they reached land, they walked on feet. While it was sunny inside, if that was how you could describe the gray shade of daylight inside the dome, outside the gate, it was pitch dark. The water looked eerie. Lorca knew he was in no condition to swim, but Grant pushed him ahead toward the water. Where are we going? Lorcan asked. I've got to work. I work at the heating ducts, and I think it's the perfect location to keep you. I can't go in the water. Well, you'll have to. I'm not paying for your transport. Lorcan tried to wiggle out of Grant's grasp, but Grant pulled the gun out from under his jacket and pointed it at him in plain sight. Bystanders on the street stopped and stared. Grant flipped the pocket open, flashing something that looked like a badge. They acknowledged it and walked away. There's something you should know about this dimension. The heating ducts is a prison for the most dangerous criminals. I'm a guard there. That makes you a criminal. You can scream or tell people what you saw back in the house, but nobody will believe you. Lorcan pushed Grant away. Grant brandished the gun. I can shoot you right here, in the line of duty. Nobody will miss you. Or you can start swimming now with me, and I can lock you in the heating ducts for safekeeping. You'll live if you choose the second option. What do you say? Lorcan nodded and moved toward the wall of water. He knew this option would have the same outcome as the first option Grant had given him. He wouldn't be able to survive the watery environment as a human. This was the bottom of the deep sea, somewhere far beneath the earth. Grant continued to walk into the water, pushing Lorcan further away from the gate. Lorcan wanted to swim back to the dome, but every movement seemed as difficult as moving a mountain. He couldn't breathe. His lungs and his brain would stop working in a few seconds due to the pressure he was already feeling. Grant must have thought he couldn't swim. He tucked his gun away and pulled Lorcan farther away from land. Lorcan couldn't speak. He couldn't get away from Grant, and it was too dark for him to see anything. His brain had gone numb, and so had his body. Using the last bit of strength he had, Lorcan reached for Grant's gun. Feeling the tug, Grant looked back, but it was too late. Lorcan aimed at his head and shot. As Grant's body sank, Lorcan felt nothing else. His brain was dying. He couldn't hold on to the gun. He let go, and his body floated to and fro with the currents. Then he heard a cheerful whistling sound. In the mysterious dim light that permeated the water, he saw the silhouettes of the dolphins and the carriage box charging toward him. They swung the box over toward him. As the door slid open, Lorcan rolled inside. The door closed instantly, and the water that had come in with him drained out quickly from the bottom of the double-layered floor. The floor immediately sealed itself up afterward. Lorcan flopped onto a passenger bench. Thank you, miracle and flipper. He heard another whistle, and the dolphins surged ahead and then swam in a circle. Maybe they needed him to tell them where he needed to go. He recalled seeing the surface on the way from the hospital to Nepalimbus. He didn't know what their word for the hospital was, or what they would call the surface. Can we go to the surface? he asked. The dolphins continued swimming in circles. Okay. So I guess you don't understand that. Can we go back to the hospital? They let out a happy sound and swam ahead. Lorcan figured they would follow the same route. When they reached the place where he had seen the surface, he would point it out and ask them to take him up. Content with his plan, he leaned back and relaxed. In no time, he got the feeling they were getting close to the spot. He looked out of the window and upward. But instead of seeing the surface, he saw the shadows of the sharks. Chapter 13 
Millie scrambled back to her quarters to change into her work clothes right after Grant took Lorcan out of the house. This could be a disaster. She should have been more disciplined about her activities and her lust for Grant. If her cover had been blown because of this incident, she would have wasted years of planning and preparation. Most importantly, she would disappoint her father. Where have you been? Faye's voice startled Millie, and she dropped the candle she was carrying to the floor. She whirled around and got down to her knees. I'm so sorry, she said. I didn't mean to drop it. Why are you so jumpy, Millie? I didn't expect you to come in here. Why not? And I asked where you've been. I've been to the temple, Faye. Do you think there were so many people there I wouldn't notice who actually attended? Uh, no, Faye. I was there. I don't know what I can do to make you believe me. Faye helped Millie up. Nobody bows in my house. We're all equal, remember? We're sisters. But they'll always be your humble servant, regardless of how much things have changed. Faye nodded. Yes, things have changed. But the social classes in Nepalimbus are so ingrained in people's minds. That will never change, she sighed. <sighs> Did you know Lorcan left? Lorcan who? Oh, the human? Faye nodded. Kai hit him quite hard, and I gave him a soothing potion that should have made him sleep for quite a while. I don't understand how he not only came to, but also got out of the room. Unless he had help. She narrowed her eyes at Millie. Oh, no, Faye. Why would I do such a thing? And even if I wanted to, I don't have the knowledge to make it happen. Faye smiled. I don't suspect you. She narrowed her eyes again. Or maybe I should? Millie could see Faye's eyes had turned cold and her shoulders stiffened for a moment. She went down to her knees again. Faye... I will never betray you. I didn't go to the temple today. I'm sorry. I stayed home to see Grant. It's only once a month that I'm free enough to do so. I'm so sorry, Faye. Faye smiled again, but the smile didn't reach her eyes. It feels better telling the truth, doesn't it? I understand how hard it is to love someone like Grant. Please forgive me, Faye. Grant was born into his social class. It wasn't his fault. There's nothing to forgive. Love makes people do stupid things, doesn't it? Yes, yes, Faye. Millie was so frightened that tears had streamed down her face. She shrunk down, hoping in her mind to make herself as small as possible, so that Faye would pay her no mind and simply walk away. Love is stupid, she muttered through her tears. Faye crouched down. How stupid. Millie blinked. I don't know what you mean. Do you really love him enough to do something for him? What do you need me to do? It's not for me. It's for your lover. I know there will be an attack at the heating ducts. The mercenaries were ordered to leave no living trace behind. You know what will happen to the guards, right? Oh, please help us. I'll go to the heating ducts to tell Grant. Can I leave for a day, Faye? You won't survive the heating ducts, Millie. Dating a guard there doesn't make you any tougher. But I do have a solution for you. I have someone who can send a message to Grant. This person has access to the internal chamber, and I'm sure reaching Grant won't be a problem. What do I owe you for that, Faye? Nothing, Faye smiled, then said. I could make use of the gateway to the surface, though. You know, where the humans live. Oh, I don't know. You don't have the pass, Faye cut in. But your father does. I'll talk to him. There's no time to waste. The moment the pass is in my hand, I'll send the messenger in for Grant. I'll leave to talk to father right now, Faye, Millie said, then bowed and scurried out of the room. She ran for a distance until her legs threatened to give up on her. She wasn't used to physical labor but she told herself she had to get used to being a commoner. If Faye could do it, so could she. That was so close, she thought. For a moment, she had thought Faye was going to kill her. 
Faye was capable of anything. She was fair, but when it came to the reign she believed in, she would kill without mercy. Millie looked at the gate of the dome. What had she just promised Faye? The pass to the surface? Her father was going to kill her just for asking. But she had no choice. Faye would kill her if she returned empty-handed. Millie exited the gate and swam home. Chapter 14 No, no, go back down, Lorcan shouted at the dolphins, but it was too late. The sharks had seen them. The sharks dove down so fast that Miracle and Flipper couldn't get away quickly enough. The dolphins swam around and around, dodging the shark attack. Lorcan was thrown up and down and sideways in the carriage. The dolphins let out a whistling noise that Lorcan thought was probably a call for help. Flipper was bitten first, then Miracle. Lorcan looked at the desperate animals being slaughtered, feeling helpless because there was nothing he could do, and he would be the next casualty. As the carriage sank, Lorcan saw the jaws full of sharp teeth moving toward him. He opened the door and dove out just before the monstrous jaws crushed the carriage. He instantly felt the pressure of the water that his human body couldn't handle. He was at the bottom of a submarine dimension. He might be wrong. Maybe the surface up there wasn't the way to Earth. He sank. From the corner of his eye, he could see the shape of a dome. But it might just be the dome of the hospital where he had killed the doctor. There was no point in him heading toward that dimension. He grabbed at the edge of a strange-looking pear-shaped rock to anchor his body, only to discover it wasn't just a rock. From his vantage point, he could see a hole in it, like a gate to something. If he turned around, he would swim into the shark's jaws. This hole could be just another sea creature's jaw, but at least he didn't see any teeth here. Making a decision, he bore his weight on the rock and pushed himself, floating, into the hole. The pressure was released instantly. Is this another dimension? He swam for a couple of meters and then flopped onto sand in a cave. A shark poked its mouth through the hole, but it was too big to follow him into the cave. It withdrew. Lorcan scrambled up to his feet and rubbed absently at his left side, where he still felt a lingering pain. He glanced around. He was in a deep, narrow, and dark cave. No sense of adventure would entice him to go down into the cave, but compared to the prospect of being a shark meal outside, or death from starvation for staying right where he was, he thought exploring the cave might result in something a bit more promising. He followed the cave wall and the coral and went inside. He didn't travel far before finding remains on the ground. It must have been a human, judging by the shape and size of the skeleton and the material that used to be its clothes. He moved in for a closer look, and his stomach did a somersault when he recognized the velvet glove and the ring from the woman on the boat. He studied at the skeleton closely. He didn't need any special medical knowledge to see that from the condition of the body, the woman had been dead for more than two days. It could take months or years for a body to decay to this degree. Faye told him he had been in a coma for two days. What was she hiding? Before he left the body, something shiny beneath the ruined fabric and in between the rib bones caught his eye. Larkin crouched down. He slid his fingers in between the bones until he touched the object. It was small and cool, like a stone. He pulled the object out. The white piece of stone stared up at him from his palm. He recognized it. This was one of the interlocking pieces of the artifact he had been supposed to steal. The other two were light green and blood red. The three of them formed a round piece of stone, like some sort of talisman. Where are the other two pieces? he asked himself aloud, while examining the stone closer. It was white and shiny, like mother of pearl. Then he looked at the dead body again. He remembered the moment before the explosion and the position in which he and the woman were standing. She wouldn't have had enough time to grab the box before the cabin exploded. So the artifact would have been blown out of the box and shattered, 
and the white stone had embedded itself in her body. Or maybe she'd survived the explosion somehow and picked up the piece from the bottom of the ocean. But that wasn't possible. Lorcan knew for a fact that the human body couldn't survive direct contact with the environment of this submarine dimension. He slid the piece of stone into his pocket and continued to walk deeper into the cave. The further he walked, the higher the temperature got. It was as if he was walking into a heated oven. The cave corridor opened to a large area, hot and reeking of rotten flesh. Lorcan could see rows of small prison cells flanking the corridor. A couple of prison guards walked past. Lorcan ducked down as far as he could in between two rock columns to hide from the guards. When they turned the corner, he crept out and walked along the hall in the opposite direction. They must have come from the exit, because the direction in which they were going went down, deeper and darker. Shh! Lorcan jumped at the noise that blasted at them. He turned and looked. It wasn't coming from the wall, but from a small window in a thick door, locked from the outside. A pair of eyes in the window stared at him, and there was a torrent of whispering. I don't speak Nepalimbian, and I don't want anything to do with you, Lorcan responded in a hushed tone and kept walking. Hey! He moved on. Hey, human! The person shouted in English, copying Lorcan's tone exactly. Lorcan glared at the creature. Don't shout, he said. Open the door for us, and then I won't make a sound. Lorcan scurried along the corridor, heading out. The man in the cell yelled, Guards! in English, and followed that with a string of Nepalimbian. Lorcan heard the footsteps of the guards charging his way from another direction. He turned and ran, but the footsteps were everywhere, echoing down the long and narrow corridor. Soon guards of all shapes and sizes, armed to the teeth, flanked both ends of the corridor. Chapter 15 You've just eaten! the keymaster exclaimed, looking at the baby angel's pouting lips. He gazed into those beautiful eyes. They had been the first thing he saw when he came to after the spider wolf's attack. He didn't know how long he had lain there in the cold moss at the top of the cliffs. He awoke and saw that the baby had somehow got out of the protective stone circle he had put around her, crawled over, and curled into his arms. He didn't know who had kept whom warm in the midst of the night. The next thing he realized, his wounds had healed. He took the baby back to his home after he buried the parents' bodies and promised them he'd take the baby to the Damon Gate. All right, I'll get you more food, but don't ask for milk. I'm not your mother. I make powerful keys that change worlds, but I don't make milk. He put a bowl of fruit in front of the baby angel. She stared at him. All right, I understand. I'm not a vegetarian either, but it's all I've got. He crouched next to the bench. I'm going to take you to the Damon Gate. People there will take care of you, much better than I do. But for now, I have this task at hand. I need to finish this key. So please bear with me. It won't take long. He returned to the large piece of stone in the middle of the room. You see? I need to make this key of Pisces. It's important, and it's supposed to be made of jade. It's more than a job for a client now. It has your mother's flesh and blood in it. The baby giggled. I know, he sighed. It's taken me three times longer than my usual process. He held up the stone carving knife. Jade isn't a hard stone to carve. It represents wisdom, balance, and peace. Do you know that? The baby made more giggling noises. I'll take that as a yes. He cut into the light green part of the stone, but the cut resealed as soon as he pulled the knife out. What the hell? This had never happened before. Well, an angel died, and her flesh and blood had been absorbed into the stone. Her blood had made a part of it red, and her flesh and feathers had made some of the stone a pure shiny white. 
At least that had been his assumption when he'd seen the three-color stone and the dead body of a female angel lying on top of it. But he wasn't sure any more. He had needed only the jade. He'd find another stone. It might take him a while, but this stone might have more than just three colors. It might not be worth his trouble. The baby made a giggling sound again. You can laugh at me now. I can't use this stone. What a waste of time. Why don't I take you to the Damon Gate and come back to this key later? The baby smiled. I knew you'd agree. You can't wait to get out of here. He approached the baby angel. She looked excited, he thought. Then she raised her hands and clapped. He covered his ears. It had been fine when she killed the wolves, but now the clapping sounded like thunder and felt as if it punctured his brain. Wait! Don't! The baby clapped a few more times and stopped. He stood still, making sure that there wasn't another round of thunder. Then from the corner of his eye, he could see the stone had broken into three different pieces, each with one of the three different colors. What have we here? he muttered. Then he looked at the baby. Do you want me to make the key with stones of three colors? The baby nodded. When you respond, it feels rather creepy, you know. Why don't you just make baby sounds? He examined the stone. Each piece was cut precisely where the color stopped. He had never done this before, but he knew now he was meant to make this key with all three colors. Green, red, white. What does this all mean? He held up the carving knife and started the work. Chapter 16 Lorcan opened his eyes and pulled the steel shackles holding him to the wall. He was in a dark dungeon, surrounded by stone walls. The cell was dimly lit, and he couldn't see a door anywhere. The heat rising from the floor was unbearable. He was surprised he hadn't turned into charcoal already. This must be the place they called the heating ducts. Human, how did you end up here? The ancient voice echoed through the room. Lorcan blinked. The voice sounded distant but it hadn't come from far away at all. An old man with striking purple eyes was shackled a few feet away. Why do you assume English is my human language? What if I spoke Cambodian? The man chuckled. <laughs> it's good that you have a sense of humor under these conditions. I'll help you retain your sanity. Lorcan looked the man up and down, in the glowing light coming from a fire at the far end of the corridor, he could see the man's formidable shape. He had long dark hair, broad shoulders, and a masculine face. There was something about him that held Lorcan's attention. Maybe it was his aura and the authority in his voice. He was sure the man wasn't human, because a human wouldn't have addressed him as human the way he had. But what exactly the man was... Lorcan couldn't tell. How long have you been here? Where are we? What do they want from us? I've lost track of time, but it hasn't been long enough for me to forget why I'm here. This is the heating ducts, isn't it? You've got the right name, but I don't think you know what it's really about. Who is that? said another voice. Why are you talking to him, father? Lorcan strained his eyes and saw a younger man tied to a wall behind the old man. He looked more frail, though, and didn't share his father's formidable features. Just rest, son. Save your strength. I don't think I can handle this, father. I am sorry I disappointed you. I only expect you to survive. Can you do that? Or did your mother die in vain? The young man started to cry. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Alexander, calm down. You'll be fine. No, father. I'm weak. I can't survive any more torture. Yes, you can. No, I can't. I'm useless. Stop it, Alexander. I order you. 
No, please let me die. Lorcan saw a spark come from the old man's eyes, and Alexander's head flipped back, then lolled toward the front. His body dangled heavily by the chains attached to the wall. You killed your son? Lorcan exclaimed, but then he saw the pain in the man's eyes. I merely put him to sleep, but whenever I do it, I draw energy out of him. He will be even weaker when he awakes. Lorcan jiggled the shackles on his hands, and they began to cut into his flesh. You must know something very important for them to kill your wife and torture your son. I hope the secret you're keeping from them is worth it. I am sure you've never had to take care of anything greater than yourself and those directly related to you. Lorcan chuckled, thinking about the family he had left a long time ago to pursue his dreams in the city, and his love for Orla, his childhood sweetheart. My family doesn't need me to take care of them. The only person more important than my own life is my lover. And what I had been trying to do was to finish off a job, buy a ring, and propose to her, and see what it got me. He yanked again at his shackles and said, I can't imagine how much more trouble I'd be in if I had to take care of something more important than that ordinary human affair. I see you're a sentimental kind of person. Should I be embarrassed about that? Most human males would be. But you don't look at all embarrassed about showing affection toward your woman. I don't need to live up to anyone's expectations. And I guess I'm selfish. Lorcan took a closer look at the man. You must be someone of high authority. The man shook his head. They have my family in here for a piece of jewelry, which if I knew where it was, I would give to them. Is that all? Yes, that's all. They heard a loud bang right in front of the door to their cell. Then the door swung open. A lanky man walked in, flanked by five creatures, all with small lizard-like heads and scaly green skin, but human-like bodies. They were armed to the teeth, with a variety of weapons dangling from their vests. The lanky man didn't wear much armor. He walked straight up to the old man. The great Fabian? Who are you? My name is Pexami. Your daughter sends me. I have no daughter. This is the only cell in which they keep the royals. Look, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I've lost fifty pets, thirty soldiers, and seventeen interworld mercenaries trying to get in here to see you. That's much more than your daughter paid for. I don't have time to waste. Before Fabian could say anything further, Pexami yanked Fabian's shirt open seeing the tattoo of two crossed tridents, turned and said to the lizard mercenaries, He's the right one. Take the sun. One of the mercenaries moved to the wall to break the shackles. Pexami asked another two to break the lock on Fabian's restraints. The old man said nothing, but Lorcan was sure there were millions of strategies running through the man's head. Lorcan figured Fabian was not only royal, but was perhaps at the highest rank in his court, or some equivalent governmental structure in this dimension. Perhaps he should hitch a ride out of here. It sounds like you've endured a massive fight to get in here, but we didn't hear any noise. If they let you get in too easily, it might be a trap, Lorcan said. Who are you? Pexami asked. No one important, but I worked my way in here via a tunnel. No one saw me until a prisoner shouted. If you break my chains, I'll take you out through that tunnel. Pexami nodded and signaled the remaining mercenary to free Lorcan. They left the cell through its already open door and stepped out into a hallway covered in the blood and gore of dead creatures, wardens, and guards. Lorcan remembered the way and navigated precisely back to the tunnel. This was one of the important skill sets he had acquired after being a spy for so long. Once they entered the tunnel, Lorcan knew it would lead them back to the cave, and then they would swim out to the sharks if they still lurked nearby. He slowed down and whispered to Fabian, 
There were sharks at the mouth of the cave. I don't know if they're still there. Pexami turned around. There's no time for chatting. The lingering pain in Lorcan's side intensified, and he rubbed at it absently. You're walking too fast, he said. I can't keep up. The mouth of the cave is straight ahead. You can't miss it. You don't need me any more. Lorcan sat down on a large rock. Pexami shrugged and signaled the mercenaries to keep going. Then a mercenary Pexami had sent ahead to survey the grounds hurried back in, speaking in a stream of language Lorcan didn't understand. But he could tell by the look on Pexami's face that he was in trouble. Chapter 17 Fabian cast a glance at Lorcan and was pleased to see he wasn't shaken by Pexami's intimidation. He liked this young human, but he disliked the aura around Pexami, the contractor his daughter had hired. My sharks are well-trained pets, Pexami growled. When I send them after prey, they don't give up. As long as their prey is still within this dimension, they will find it. Lorcan backed away, and his back struck the cave wall. Pexami approached slowly. You are the only human prey I sent them after. I don't know what you're talking about. You're the human from the boat. The one with the key. I don't know anything about a key. Faye is such a bitch. She paid me to get you. She knew you were with her family. She sent me to rescue her family and you, paying the same amount of money. I don't like the way you are talking about my daughter, Fabian said, and let out a long whistle. The sound penetrated the air and the dark water ahead. Fabian inhaled the air in the cave again, enjoying the freshness of it. He whistled again, calling for his daughter. Not only would he have his freedom back now, he had a feeling his reign would be returning. God had finally answered his prayers. Before the mercenaries could react, Fabian's eyes sparked a bright purple shade. All five of them dropped to the ground like sacks of potatoes. Fabian smiled to himself. This was one of his many talents. He could vacuum the energy out of any person or creature he wanted. Generations of his family had descended here from Earth. They were living happily in the Polymbus as royals before being overthrown. It pained him to think about Faye being out there by herself, struggling to survive in disguise, working nonstop to rescue the family so they could resume their government. His daughter was not a commoner. One day, she would be the rightful queen of this submarine dimension. Pexami grabbed his chest and slumped to the ground. He spat out black blood. Poison, he muttered. He looked up at Fabian. Trademark of your daughter. I curse your entire family, he said, and then fell to the ground, dead. Fabian looked at Lorcan. Something has to give for the greater good. He farms the killing sharks, and that is unforgivable under my reign. The situation suggests that the reign you talk about isn't current. You're a smart man. No wonder you're the chosen one. Look, I know nothing about a key, and if you mention it one more time, I'm going to be pissed. I'm a spy and a thief. Yes, I steal for clients, but I'm no key keeper, and if you paid me, I'd give you the key. I wouldn't keep it. There was a sound like a train going past outside, then it grew quiet again. Faye and Kai rushed into the cave. Faye darted toward Fabian and dropped to her knees as if she saw no one else there but him. He crouched, clutching her in his arms and letting her cry. The emotion came out of her like a storm. Kai glanced around, pulled out a knife, and killed the sleeping mercenaries. Was that necessary? Lorcan asked. No, but if they awakened, they would kill you without asking whether it was necessary, Kai said. 
Faye's emotion subsided. She stood up, glanced around. Her eyes stopped on Lorcan. He was put in the same cell with us, Fabian said. You hired Pexami to grab him from the surface, so he must have something to do with the key. No, father. She looked down on the ground. Fabian lifted her chin and looked into her eyes. Don't lie to me, Fay. A tear rolled down her cheek. She nodded. Yes, he might have information about the key. He was with it before it vanished. We're working on finding it. Fabian nodded. I understand it's difficult for you to be out there on your own doing all this, but without the key, we can't rebuild our reign. I understand, Father, and I'm sorry about Mother. I'm too late for her. Fabian wiped away a tear on Faye's face. Your mother's death wasn't your fault. I am proud of you, my daughter. Now all we have to do is find the key, and our years of suffering will end. Lorcan cleared his throat. I've got to go now. Good luck with everything. He turned, but Kai stepped forward, blocking his way. Unfortunately, I can't let you go back to the human's world, Fabian said, before we have all the information about the key. I told you, I don't know. Lorcan pushed Kai, and Kai swung his arm at him. Lorcan blocked, and Kai stomped a kick to his abdomen, hurling him into the far wall. A white ivory object dropped from Lorcan's pocket to the ground. Fabian stared at it. He knew he was not mistaken. On the ground was the white piece from the three-colored Key of Pisces. You said you didn't know anything about the Key of Pisces, Fabian said. I don't. That's just merchandise for a client. But you have only one piece. Where are the other two? I already told you. I don't know anything. Lorcan couldn't back away any further as he was up against a wall. He looked toward the cave entrance and saw that Kai stood there, blocking it. I am sure you're a good human. I can tell. The key means a lot to us. There are millions of citizens and families who are depending on our return for survival. If I knew anything about the key, I'd tell you. But unfortunately, I don't. Faye, does he have the information in his mind? Faye shook her head. Fabian frowned. He tilted her chin up. He didn't have his daughter's talent, but he knew how she thought and when she lied to him. He glanced back at Lorcan, who had quickly figured the situation he was in could prove troublesome for him. You've got the whole key, he said to Lorcan. Lorcan darted at the entrance, but after a few rounds exchanging punches and kicks with Kai, he was thrown inside once again. Beating him up or even killing him won't bring us anything positive, father. Let me work this out, Faye said to Fabian inching her way inside the cave to stand in front of Lorcan. You have a gentle soul, Fay, but any war must have sacrifice, Fabian said. But this isn't my war, Lorcan exclaimed. Call it collateral damage, and you are the casualty, human. Fabian smiled, but it didn't quite reach his eyes. Chapter 18 Love! The keymaster looked at the toddler angel, who was sitting on a bench in a humble stone house, playing with her toys. She smiled at him and said, Love! He rolled his eyes and crouched. Seriously? It's been a year since you made me carve the key of Pisces out of three stones. I have used all my resources and the knowledge of hundreds of years making keys, and I couldn't make them snap into one piece. And now you're telling me it's love that glues them together? The toddler giggled and raised her hands. Oh, no, no clapping inside the house, please. Remember what happened last time when you clapped? I'm too busy to build one house after another, 
just because you have a compulsive clapping disorder. She smiled at him and twirled her finger in a lock of his hair. Love, she said again. All right, let's say I'm not offended at all because I've taken care of you for a year and the first word you've ever spoken to me regarding the glue for this crazy key is love. How the hell am I going to use love to make them snap together? The dim light in the room made Lorcan's hair look even darker. Faye couldn't take her eyes off his face. He looked peaceful when he was asleep, but when he woke, she knew a storm would be heading her way. She didn't know how to handle this. It was rare for her to be in a situation where every decision she made tended to go wrong. She tugged at the ropes tying his hands and feet to the four posters of the bed, ensuring they didn't cut into his skin. It pained her to do this, but she would rather he live imprisoned than be free and dead. Her father had knocked him out using his energy suction. That meant when he woke, he would be very weak and certainly not in a good mood. Lorcan's eyelids fluttered, and gradually opened. His magnificent blue eyes were now looking at her, demanding answers. She braced herself against the wall. Before you accuse me of anything, remember, I saved your life, Lorcan. I'm not sure about that. You hired Pexami to capture me and destroy the boat, did you not? I paid Pexami to obtain the key, and you got tangled up in the ordeal. I didn't have any plans to capture you. Then why am I here? Why am I tied up? Why did your father think I was holding the whole key? He was suspicious because you had the white piece with you. She pulled out the piece of the key and placed it on the bed next to Lorcan. That was only because a stupid shark chased me into that stupid cave. I know nothing about the key's whereabouts. Why did you suggest to your father that I had that information? I was in your subconscious mind. So you're saying that in two days, you know my mind intimately enough to know what's going on. Not only that, you're suggesting that when I wake, I conveniently forget that I know? I suggested nothing like that to my father. I'm trying to figure out a way to tell you what's going on without killing you. I'm a big boy. I can handle the truth, especially what you can accumulate in a couple of days. For pity's sake, I'm a mind reader, and for two years we were intimate in your subconscious mind. You told me everything about your life, Lorcan. Two years? he exclaimed. She walked to one side of the room, then whirled around and paced in the other direction. Yes? You were in a coma for two years, she returned to the bed. Look, you need to calm down, Lorcan. I need to explain to you how I think your mind works before we can proceed. It's been two years since the incident? What about Orla? She must think I'm dead. She can't think I'm dead. I can't just vanish from her life for two years without a trace. He pulled hard at the ropes, tying him to the bed. Let me go. Faye walked back and forth again, raking her hands through her hair. The door slid open, and Kai walked in with a tray and a glass of water. He glanced at Lorcan. He's awake. You can rest now, Faye. You've been up all night. He gave her the water. Since when do you do Millie's job? Millie is back and is waiting for you in her quarters. She said she has what you asked her to get. Kai's eyes darkened when he looked at her face. Faye wiped away a tear that had rolled down her face. Kai pointed his chin at Lorcan. He won't give you the information. Lorcan tugged at the ropes again. If I know, I don't remember. Let her pry the info out of me. She's a mind reader, isn't she? Kai jumped right onto the bed and grabbed Lorcan by the neck. You prick. If you don't fucking give me the information, I'll break your neck with one hand. I don't have the patience she has. And more importantly, 
I don't have the feelings she has for you. Don't do that, Kai. She grabbed Kai's shoulders, but couldn't move him an inch away from Lorcan. And break my neck, asshole. When you're gone from the lives of everyone you care about for two years, you're better off being dead. You think I won't kill you? Kai squeezed harder on Lorcan's neck. I don't believe you want to die. Please don't do that, Kai. Please stop, Faye cried. Try me, Lorcan shouted at Kai. We still need the info, and dead men don't talk. But I'll see how well you handle pain. He grabbed Lorcan's head at the temples and pressed. Lorcan yanked at the rope, his eyes rolling back with the pain. Kai, please stop, Kai, Faye cried. She untied Lorcan's hands and could see he wasn't struggling at the ropes. He was convulsive. She saw blood soaking his shirt on his side. She threw herself to the floor. Kai, please stop. You're killing him. And by doing that, you're killing me too, Kai. I love him. I love him with all my heart. Please don't kill him. Kai stopped and backed away. The blood at Lorcan's side continued to pool, and he continued to convulse. She flipped his shirt up and could see a piece of jade had broken his skin and was sticking out. The white piece of the key on the bed vibrated. This isn't just a theory now. We need to wake him, Kai. Kai untied Lorcan's feet. Faye held him in her arms to calm him down. Lorcan, when you love someone more than your life, it puts the key pieces together. But you won't die because of this. You're not going to die. I will take you back to the time you came from. You will not lose Orla. Do you hear me? Lorcan didn't appear to hear anything. The jade piece had come completely out of him and dropped to the bed. He's not in control of this. The red piece is in his heart. If it comes out, he'll die. We need to snap him out of this. Please do something, Kai. Kai grabbed Lorcan from Faye's arm, threw him on the bed, and punched him in the face. The convulsion stopped. Soon after, Lorcan let out a moan and opened his eyes. He sat up, wincing with the pain. Then he looked at Faye's face. She scrambled off the bed and wiped the tears from her face. Lorcan looked at the piece of jade and the blood on his shirt. I heard part of your conversation, he said. Which? Which part? Faye asked. The red piece is in my heart and you were going to stop it from coming out? Thank you. Faye exhaled her relief. You're welcome. I have a plan to get it out. But before I tell you, I need to clear something up first. Lorcan sat, leaning against the wall. Please, entice me. Kai, if he moves wrong, could you please punch him? Kai cracked his knuckles. With pleasure he said. Lorcan rolled his eyes. The three pieces snap into one complete piece only when someone loves someone else more than his or her own life. Even if we extracted the pieces from your body, if you die, we still can't put it together. So the key is broken, and someone with great love can put it together. Sounds mythical, but I get it, Lorcan said. That is the hard part. Judging by the way your mind works, I believe you're not 100% human. My mother would be offended to hear that, but please continue. Not only that, it seems to me if the right piece of information is triggered, something in your mind just switches on and takes control. To what extent, I don't know. But so far, I gather that one of the triggers is anything that has to do with your relationship with Orla. And when your mind is taken over, it rejects life. She stared into his eyes. Don't worry, I'm still here. If you're right, I think the process only kicks in when I'm in helpless situations. When I believe I can't get out of a situation, all the life and death thought processes kick in. 
but now I'm fine. And if you touch me again, Kai, I'll kick your ass. Kai smiled. All right. So now that that is out of the way, what's your solution to get the key, Faye? I asked Millie to borrow her father's pass to the gateways. He used to be one of the gatekeepers. When you sank down to Nepalimbus, you went through several dimensions of time and space, not just water. If we travel back up and choose the right gate, we can get back to the time before the explosion. Lorcan smiled. Perfect plan. That way I can avoid the involuntary implementation of foreign objects into my body. And you can get the key in entirety. But will I remember anything when I travel back? This isn't standard time traveling, so in theory, yes, you will remember. Just like us. Great. So let's do it, Kai said. Lorcan stood and said to Kai, I don't really like not being in control of my own body. So if you ever knock me out again, make sure you kill me, because I'll kick your warrior ass when I get back. The door slid open, and Fabian stepped in. His purple eyes sparked when he saw Lorcan. Going somewhere? he asked. Chapter 19 Fabian crawled on the muddy road, soaking wet with the storm water. He hated himself for surfacing and walking on human land against the advice of his counsel. He clutched the toddler Fay in his arms, covering her with his cloak as much as he could to keep her out of the cold. She looked at him with her big, striking blue eyes. Most toddlers would cry in the same situation. She didn't. Exhausted, he sat leaning against a rock, the rain splashing on his face. The water was too far away. He was sure he would never make it back home. In Nepalimbus, traveling through the water was like eating and breathing. But here, the rainwater only accelerated his pain and made the wound on his side bleed more. Father, you're hurt. I'll go and seek help. He smiled weakly at his daughter. She had spoken even before she'd eaten, walked, and swam. Her first word had been father, and her second word was fight, when she demanded he take her to where he trained the Nepalimbus soldiers. One day he would make her queen of Nepalimbus, but he didn't want her to devote her whole life to the rain. He wanted to bring out the human side of her, the warm-hearted qualities from her human mother, so he had taken her to a land to be blessed by his human white witch mentor. All he had found was her ruined cottage and lots of blood. Then he'd been attacked by unknown creatures. He wouldn't regret dying here, but it pained him to think about what would happen to Fay if he died on human land. From the midst of the storm, someone walked toward him from the bush. A large cloak to keep the rain off covered most of the person's body, but he could tell by the posture that it was a woman. She approached and crouched at eye level with Faye. The light was just enough for him to see her piercing green eyes, eyes that didn't belong to an ordinary human. I am a shaman, she said to Faye. Then please heal my father. Come here, Faye, he called, reaching out for her, but she stood still in the rain, eyeing the woman. I can see you are a strong child. I can see no weakness in you. And I can see your future of being a great leader of a place far, far away. Come back here, Fay. Fabian had figured out he'd been immobilized. The last thing he did was shout, Don't listen to her, Fay," And then even his ability to speak vanished. Don't worry, father. I won't let her harm you or myself. The woman chuckled. Oh, look what we have here. Both a mind reader and a leader at this age. Fascinating. Please heal my father. He's injured. He needs to take me home. What will you give me for healing your father? What would you like? The shaman laughed. What a little negotiator you are. 
your father will die here if I don't heal him. So for me to save his life, what you give must be quite significant. I'm only a child. I don't have any money. But I can vow a debt to you if money is what you want. The shaman laughed harder, opening her mouth wide and almost choking on the falling rain. You have made my day, child. I like you so much. I'll do this for free. Thank you. I have no intention of harming either you or your father. But I do have a prophecy for you. You will grow up to be the queen of a faraway place. You will be a strong and judicious queen and have no weakness except one. You will fall in love with a silver-blood soldier, and that will be your fatal weakness. I shall remember that. Will you heal my father now? Not so fast, child. You're smart, but you don't know the power of this prophecy. Here is what I want to heal your father. When your weakness becomes the truth and you are at a loss, you must come to me for help before it kills you. This is not a debt. It's more like a favor. As I said, I like you. Do I have your word? Yes, I promise. I might be very young now, but I know how to keep my promises. The shaman nodded. All right, then. I am the shaman of the Black Mountain in the Middle Land. I hope to see you again one day. Chapter 20 Fay exited the hallway and headed toward the door. Kai walked by her side, with Lorcan dangling over his shoulder. Her father had put Lorcan out again for this trip. It was the most convenient way to handle the situation. Fay glanced back at the great hall and saw her father standing still, his hands in his pockets. He nodded at her with blessing and encouragement, as he always did. She promised him she would come back as soon as she had obtained the key. She promised him she was well aware of the prophecy and wouldn't let it get to her. She didn't know what Lorcan was exactly, but she knew he wasn't a silver-blood soldier. Silver blood was mere rumor, anyway, and so were the soldiers who were supposed to carry that powerful property of the multiverse. Millie scurried along, trying to match Kai's very long strides. Can you please pretend that Lorcan has some weight to him? Isn't he like six foot five? Millie said, running and out of breath from having to keep up with Kai. He's six eleven. You measured him? No, I'm a fighter. I'm quite accurate when gauging my opponent's size and weight. See if you can measure up my Grant. He's the best fighter, Millie muttered. By the way, did you see Grant when you went into the heating ducts, Faye? Huh? Did you message Grant at the heating ducts? I sent a message, but it didn't get to him. I didn't see him there. Millie pulled a sea worm from her side pocket. No, Millie, please don't take the worm messenger with you. We're in a hurry here, Faye said. Yes, Faye. Millie let the worm go and scurried toward the carriage that Kai had put Lorcan inside. Inside the carriage, Faye checked the box containing the white and jade pieces of the key. They were intact. Are you ready, Millie? I am, Millie said. She pulled out the rectangular pass to the gate, and Kai began to navigate the carriage dolphin to the correct gate. Soon they passed into the dark water, through layers and layers of time and space dimensions. Gradually, a dim-lit surface appeared above them. This is as far as the dolphins can go. We have to get out here and surface, Millie said. Faye was about to check on the wound on Lorcan's side where the jade piece was when Kai grabbed her hand. Be patient, Faye. It will work. He tapped on the side of the carriage, signaling the dolphins to stop. They got out of the carriage and kicked their way to the surface, breaking through the water in the middle of the open sea in the human dimension. Faye had been here before, 
and she was sure the experience would be much the same. Kai still held Lorcan in his arm, keeping his head above the water's surface. Are you both okay? she asked. I'm fine, Kai said. Me too, Millie said, her teeth chattering loudly. Fay pulled out the box containing the two pieces and opened it. The stones had vanished. She showed it to Kai and Millie. It worked. That means the red piece has gone from Lorcan's heart, and they're all back on the boat now. A short distance away, they could see the cruise ship lit up with party lights and alive with music. They began to tread water and move toward the ship. When they got close, they waved their hands to get the attention of the boat's passengers. Someone's in the water. A man on the ship holding a champagne glass in one hand pointed at them. A spotlight from the boat shone on them in the water. When Lorcan was placed on the floor of the boat, a woman in a red velvet dress asked, Is that Mitch Wayland? What was he doing in the water? Is he okay? He hit his head on the way down. He's fine, Faye said. Kai pressed on Lorcan's chest, causing him to spit out water and gasp for air. A medical doctor is coming, the man with the champagne glass said. We're from the other boat, Kai said and pointed out in the distance. Water camping for the night. Then he came to us on a small boat, asking these two ladies to go out fishing. He wasn't as good a boat driver as he promised. I'll bet he has a gallon of alcohol in his blood, the woman in the velvet dress said. The doctor rushed in. Please, take him down to the medical room, he said after checking Lorcan's eyes and his pulse. Lorcan tried to sit up, but he was still very dazed. Let me. Kai said. He threw Lorcan over his shoulders and followed the doctor. In the medical compartment, the doctor was happy with Lorcan's condition and had stepped outside for a moment. Lorcan opened his eyes immediately, grinning widely. How? You looked like you were dead just a second ago, Millie said. Well, I'm not now. He sat up and his eyes landed on Fay. He paused there for a second but not long enough to embarrass her, and then he hopped off the bench. This is my turf, so I'll take care of this. Just follow my directions. I know where the key is. I can break the lock and give you the box with the key in it. But keep an eye out for a woman in a red velvet dress. She was the one who set up the explosive. He gestured toward the door. Kai and Millie exited. Faye was about to follow, when she felt Lorcan's touch at her elbow. May I have a word with you? Sure, she stayed in the room with him. He looked at her with his blue eyes, the ones that always made her stomach quiver. I heard more of the conversation between you and Kai than the part about the red piece implanted in my heart. Faye could feel her face burning. She tried to read his mind to guess what he was about to say but her mind-reading talent was only consistent in her own dimension. When nothing came to her from Lorcan's mind, she gave up and prepared herself for what was coming. You're blushing now, but I have to say this. I am flattered that you have feelings for me, Faye. But I am a spy and a data thief. You're a royal, and you deserve a lot better for what you've done for your family and your people. There's a prophecy. No, Fay. I am a scientist. Magical explanations aren't going to work with me. But I do understand this. Your reign and your work has occupied your mind for years. And when you saw the human emotion in my mind, you fell in love with it. You love the idea of being in love and being cared for. And you deserve all of that. But not from me. Enough said. No, I don't think you understand. I think you're overlooking what you've got and who you've got. I am just an illusion, a dream to you. A dream is beautiful, but it's not real. You have a real man standing by you and loving you and every waking moment he has. You're overlooking that. 
I said that's enough, Lorcan. Okay, I've said what I had to say. If we part after this, and if whatever happens makes me forget all of what happened in Nepalimbus, I want you to know I care about you. And please, do yourself a favor. Love the man who loves you. You both deserve it. Shall I go? Sure. He pushed the compartment door open. Chapter 21 From the foyer of the ship, looking up to the upper deck where the tycoon host was entertaining his VIP guests, Lorcan could see the woman in the velvet dress. She glanced at him, nodded, and smiled. But unlike what had happened before, she remained there talking to the other guests and didn't approach him. Faye stood next to him, so Lorcan turned and asked, Is it possible that the situation here has changed compared to what happened before because I've come back from Nepalimbus? She nodded. This is not good, Lorcan thought. It meant he didn't have any advantages from the comeback, and there was no way they could benefit from what he had learned before. There was one thing, however, that he was certain was unchanged, and that was his thievery mission. He entered the hallway and used the boat's phone to contact his client. He entered the passcode and PIN number. The encoded message he received suggested that the mission was still on. He nodded at Fay, Kai, and Millie and headed downstairs. They followed him. In the narrow corridor that led toward the compartment where he knew the tycoon kept the safe, the light flickered a couple of times and then became steady. Lorcan waited. Before the group caught up to him, a waiter carrying a tray of drinks on his hand walked toward Lorcan. Lorcan stepped aside to let him pass. As he moved past, Lorcan noted he wore a large ring on the outside of the gloved hand with which he held the tray above his shoulder. When the hand got close to Lorcan, a needle poked out of the ring. Lorcan figured the woman's role had been passed on to this waiter. He grabbed the waiter's hand with one of his own, scooped the tray away from him, and then stuck the waiter with his own needle. The group approached him. He thrust the tray at Kai and caught the waiter as he slumped down. To the elevator compartment on the left, second to the last door, he said. He half-dragged, half-carried the waiter to the elevator compartment and squeezed him in. Then they went down a level. Lorcan navigated back to where the explosion had occurred previously. He pushed the waiter in. We need to wake him, Lorcan said. Kai said nothing. He picked the waiter up by the collar and punched him in the face. The man moaned, and his eyes fluttered open. Lorcan searched him, pulling a gun from the waiter's pocket. Did you plant explosives in here? Don't lie, because you're going to be staying right here with us, Lorcan said. The waiter shook his head. Is there a disposable submarine attached to this compartment? He shook his head again. Lorcan grabbed a rope he found behind some equipment and tied the waiter securely to a steel rail. Where's the safe? I don't know about any safe. He pointed the gun at the waiter's head. We don't have time for nonsense. Where is the artifact? Tell me, or I'll blow your head off. Don't, please. It's here. In here. There isn't a safe. Lorcan pressed the gun harder against his temple. It's under the tank. In a box. Please don't kill me. It's just a job. Take what you want. Lorcan left the waiter and headed to the tank in the corner. It was empty, and from the bottom, he pulled out a large steel box with a lock. It's primitive technology. Shouldn't take long, he muttered, and quickly decoded the lock. In a few seconds, the lock clicked open. He opened the lid and saw a time bomb staring up at him. Its clock was counting down. Explosives. We've got sixty seconds. I'm sure this is your key of Pisces box, but I don't have time to unlock the key box to check. Lorcan carefully pulled out a box with a carving on top that he knew he had seen before. He thrust it at Fay. 
He turned back to the bomb. Shouldn't we run now? Kai asked. Untie me, please. Let me go. I know nothing about this, the waiter cried. Lork and Gingerly separated the wires on the explosive. You go, he said to Fay. There won't be enough time to make it off the ship, but there'll be a lesser impact from above. I won't leave you here, Fay said. Let me go, the waiter cried again. Look out, Kai shouted and darted toward Fay. He pulled her toward him, the momentum pushing his body forward and copping the full impact of a blade from Millie, who was standing behind Fay. Millie withdrew the blade, and Kai's body collapsed to the floor. Fay and Lorcan turned to Millie and saw that her face had turned white, and her eyes were bloodshot. One of her arms was transforming from a blade back to its normal shape, and the other was holding the key box. You're that hologram, Lorcan said. You're the sea witch Sonia, Fay muttered. You could retrieve the bodies of your servant Millie and her boyfriend from the bottom of the sea. Sonia turned to leave. Not so fast, said Lorcan. He pulled his gun and savaged Sonia's head. He had been quick, and she hadn't been able to use her magic to avoid the hit. Her head and body exploded. As the bomb ticked down to the final seconds, Lorcan pushed Fay out of the way and threw himself on top of it. Fay used every ounce of her power to whistle, a terrifying sound with a frequency that could cut the sea in half. The sound penetrated the wall of the ship and opened up into the water. The sea poured inside. The liquid environment was best for her power. She grabbed Kai's body and then Lorcan by the collar and then shot through the water to move them all outside the ship. The explosion came. She felt the impact, but she pushed forward with the waves and the pressure. Lorcan and Kai were totally out. The ship split in half, and each side of it began to drop down into the deep sea. People jumped and cried out for rescue. Shards of wood from the broken boat floated around her. Amid the chaos, through the layers of dark water, she could see the box with the key in it, sinking in the distance. She had to let it go. She made a mental note of its location, so that she could come back later. But for now, Lorcan and Kai's bodies dangled from her hands. She needed to bring them to safety. She turned around, looking inland, where help from humans would come. She swam toward a large piece of wood from a broken door and flung Lorcan and Kai on top. She dove beneath the water's surface, grabbed the door handle, and pushed them toward the shore. She didn't just swim. She surfed the currents. She commanded the waves, gathered the energy of the water, and charged ahead. The water became shallow quickly, and she hit land. She stood up and saw several vehicles with flashing lights arriving at the shoreline. Several men ran over, pulling Lorcan and Kai onto the sand. A man approached her. Are you okay, ma'am? He asked and handed her a blanket. She nodded. Please, help them. Are they all right? We're taking them to the emergency now. Did you just bring them in from that accident? He pointed out in the distance where the flames from the boat explosion still soared into the air. Several small boats were discharged to the scene to rescue any survivors. Lorcan and Kai were both placed in the same emergency vehicle, and she followed them inside. In the hospital emergency room, they were pushed into separate areas, divided by a curtain. She darted back and forth between them, checking on their conditions. Soon Lorcan opened his eyes, he blinked and looked at her, as if he'd never seen her before. Lorcan! Who are you? Fay withdrew. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I thought you were someone else. A beautiful woman rushed to his bedside. From outside the curtain, Fay could hear her fussing over him. What did you do on that boat, Lorcan? Don't be mad, Orla. I thought it was the last job. Fay went to the other room and saw that the doctor had stopped working on Kai. Excuse me, 
Is he okay now? I'm sorry, ma'am. He's lost a lot of blood. If you're his next of kin, you might want to say a few last words. But you'll have to hurry. She ran to the bed. It was the first time she had seen Kai like this. He didn't talk. He just lay there. The pain in her heart was unbearable. It was like a hole had been ripped in her heart and soul, an empty space she would never be able to fill. What Lorgan had said on the boat made perfect sense now. She had overlooked this. She had never appreciated what she'd had. It was Kai who had always stood by her, no matter what. She stared at the machine, which suggested his pulse was weakening by the second. She could not accept this. She held his hand and looked out to the darkening sky outside. Shaman of the Black Mountain, I'm calling you, wherever you are. I am in your debt, as I promised, and I am calling you, as I promised. I am at a loss. Please help me. A cold breeze rushed in through the window and cracked the glass. The entire hospital was blacked out. Kai opened his eyes to see Fay's beautiful face smiling at him. He smiled back. But it probably looked more like a wince. He ached everywhere. His body felt useless. Fay traced her finger over his chest. Toughen up, soldier, she said. He recalled what happened and remembered the sensation of the blade penetrating his body. I was stabbed and almost died. But I didn't. Where's Lorcan? Did you get the key? She placed a finger over his lips to stop him from talking. It's all figured out. Lorcan is safe and sound. And the best part is, you are alive. I would hate to have to recruit a new guard. I didn't do a very good job on the boat. If you hadn't, we wouldn't be here. I can't believe I survived. I called in a favor from an old friend. What favor? Which friend? What did this cost you? She locked her lips with his to stop his words. He felt as if he was melting into her. He could feel her body vibrating with emotion. She finished with the kiss. Maybe he shouldn't say anything, because if she did that one more time, his head would explode. My friend fixed you. You're alive and well. That's all that matters. Where are we? She smiled. Black Mountain. His heart sank when he heard the name of the origin of her prophecy. He didn't care for the details, because he knew that even if they survived Black Mountain, it would be a very long way home.